What's happening, buddy? How are you? We're very busy. We got a lot going on, Steve. A lot going on, but all good stuff. All good good stuff. stuff. Really good stuff. So tonight, right, uh, November 8th, 7 o'clock, we got the Barnes & Noble virtual book signing. We're going to, it's moderated by Matt Wolf, and we're going to talk and all kinds of stuff. And you buy a book with Barnes & Noble, woke up this morning, and it's tonight. See in the description below. That's how you get on. Please join us tonight at 7 p.m. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Get the book. Get us online. I think they can ask questions, too, right? They can yes. write in and ask questions, so it'll be fun. Uh, today, though, today's show, we're going to do something a little different. We have five guests, five great guests on the show. Everyone is absolutely fantastic. First up, Frank Renzulli. Great Frank- writer. Renzulli is one of the initial writers on the show, grew up in Boston, grew up kind of in a soprano land of Boston and had, you know, a lot of his stories wound up from his, you know, childhood growing up around the mob, made it to the show. He's someone who really helped develop the voice and the tone of the sopranos. Then we have a good buddy, Rob Sprague oh, I like him. from Alabama 3. Rob wrote and sang the Soprano theme song, Woke Up This Morning, which really became almost like another character on the show. Every week, the show opened with Rob Sprague and Alabama 3. We also have Henry Yuck. He's going to join us today. He played Sung Young Kim, the guy who owned the laundry service and was killed by Tony Blundetto. Uh, Henry's been in a ton of movies. He's He's a, you know one of the quintessential New York actors, and we're going to talk to him about his uh, this experience on The Sopranos and his career. We also have uh, the Ray Donovan of The Soprano family, executive producer Eileen Landris, who knows all the inside dish because she was the one running things behind the scenes. She was our fixer. She was on the ground with us when we would travel. She was like, on the set, in the office, taking care of business left and right on The Sopranos. Also, Dan Adias, one of our great directors who worked on The Sopranos. This is going to be a good one. But before we get started, Steve? Woke up this morning. The definitive oral history of The Sopranos is now available everywhere. And it's selling like crazy. It's a big hit. We've gotten great reviews. If you're a fan of Sopranos, you're going to really love this. So pick up your copy wherever books are sold, and things are going fast. It's amazing, uh, Michael, how well we've done, and I'm very happy and proud of it. And if you you still got time to get tickets to our live show, Comedy and Conversation with the Sopranos, we're performing live on Saturday, November 20th at the Andiamo Theater in Warren, Michigan. Vinny Pastor joins us as well as the great comedian Joey Cola. Come on out. Uh, we'd love to see you there. Just go to Talking Sopranos website to see all the live dates we have coming up. We're in Staten Island, St. George Theater uh, in February. So please check that out. Now let's get into our interview with the great Frank Renzulli. Very big part of the success of The Sopranos was due to the writing of this guest. Yes, And a real behind the scenes kind of guy. A lot of people don't know. He's a little camera shy when he doesn't, uh, not out and about front and center, but he had a huge impact on the success. And some of the favorite lines and names of characters were done by this gentleman. He was born in Boston, Mass. He's a very successful actor, writer, and producer. He also, uh, as an actor, he appeared in 25 films, TV series, including one of my favorite all time movies. Broadway, Danny Rose, Ray Donovan, The Practice, L.A. Law. He's written episodes for 14 different TV series, including The Walking Dead, Crash, That's Life, and The Practice. He's produced 25 episodes of The Sopranos and wrote nine of them, two of which were nominated for Emmys. Please welcome our dear friend, wonderful writer, and actor Frank Renzulli. There he there is. There you go. Thank you. What, a, what an introduction. Thank there you. There you go, Frank. Good to see oh, you. Thanks guys. for doing this, man. Yeah, no, listen. Um, I've heard from somebody, when are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? And, and I, 
you know, and there was a couple misses and I'm here. Right. Well, I'm we got glad, you. I'm glad yeah. you're here. Now you're not, you, you know, this whole thing, Zoom and doing stuff, that's not your bag, right? The tech oh, side I'm, of things. I'm, no, I'm 1955. I mean, you're 1955. Yeah, I, I want to go back. <laughs> I want to go back. Before, I, I blame the beginning of all this with the pager. I'm the pager. <laughs> little bit, and it was it was good. at first. And then every drug dealer in the world had a fucking pager. You know, <laughs> they had three of them, four. And it's a fuck. As a matter of fact, when I first made the transition from actor, trying to be an actor to writing the first like big, if you want to call it that meeting I had was with the, uh, you know, uh, was it with Lorimar and the executive assistant said to me, Frank, can I get your, 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 your car phone number? And I said, sure. And I said, 799 NZJ. And she said, what? <laughs> you want me? It's my fucking license plate. You better call <laughs> Chips. Highway Patrol because I'm like, fucking car phone. What the fuck is that? Now you grew up. Uh, you, you born in Boston. You grew up in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you did where you grew up? Was there a presence of the mob? Was it something your family had proximity to, or you remember as a kid? Like, was that part of your? I, listen, if bless bless her soul, my mother, if I had become a wise guy, oof, she would have been happy. She would have been, been happy. happy. I'm happy. Yeah. That was that was that was like a job. I mean, you got a future. But um, yeah, no, I grew up in a, a, a thick Italian American neighborhood, and my childhood was literally from my earliest memories was hanging around a social club. Really? Oh yeah, I, I, you know, how bizarre is this? I would have been Spider. Really? Who I would have been? That was. A, you remember there was one episode, the card game, the executive game, the Happy they, Wanderer. Which, you wrote, one, which is yeah. a great one of our, you know, favorite episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that literally came from me doing that job in the club where, you know, every once in a while they'd have a high end game. Usually it was it was, you know, nuts and bolts, guys, regular working guys in this game. But every once in a while they'd I, and I called it the executive game because they would wise guys would come in from different parts of the city and they had big money they're playing. My job, I couldn't deal to save your fucking soul. I mean, terrible deal. And so I work the games and get drinks, food, whatever they wanted. You know, I was a young guy, so 16. And, uh, and there was one guy in there. Uh, he, every time he bet, he'd take a bite of cheese or whatever, and he'd go, he'd, he'd throw it on the floor and he'd go, how much in the pot? How much? How the fuck is that? And I, now, the guy who, whose club it was, who was, my, who was I, who's a lot of what you hear in my writing for, you know, those old school characters was through this guy, J.R., Joe Russo. Who, that was his area that he controlled. J.R. was a, completely different than any most wise guys you meet. And so he did me that. He, Cheech, they call me Cheech, you know. And he goes, Cheech, Cheech, like that, you know. And... I go like, you know, the big old Italian communication. What? You go like this with the broom. Like, fucking drove him crazy that this one wise guy was thrown, thrown on the floor. So he cleaned that fucking shit off the floor. So I went over there with the broom and I'm trying to do it gingerly, you know. That, uh, and that's the scene where, where um, Silvio. Silvio. So exposed. That really, I, I could never put. Even on HBO, what this guy said to me, <laughs> all right? Like an explosion. He goes, what the fuck? And he knocked the food all over the place. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> You're getting the cheese. The cheese. Like, I fucking love cheese. And I won't even say it on this, what he said to me. The smell of cheese reminds me of, you know, in fact, the fuck out with the cheese. The fuck are you doing, Joe? What's this kid doing? What the, get him the fuck out of here. What the fuck? I'm losing 200,000. All right. So now you know how this goes with these guys. 15, 20 minutes go by. I'm nowhere near this guy. You know, he catches a fucking bad card. He goes, your sister's fucking 
whatever, you know, but it's fucking, you suck, point them at the deal, and you suck, you fucking die under it, and then jump up, and this motherfucker with the broom, with the broom, with the fucking cheese, the fucking... What the fuck? I, 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 no matter where I went in the club, I fire every once in a while. Whenever it happened, they'd be stubbed his toe. He went right back to the fucking cheese. But the, the button on this whole thing is, it's like the next day, next night, you know, these fucking games would go on forever. Joe, JR, he, he says, Cheech, I got a mission for you. Not a good one. What the fuck? And he goes, you got to drive him home. Wow. <laughs> I had to drive this fucking guy. I had to drive that guy home. And from, 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 from that moment, I don't know how many miles, three, four, five miles maybe. Everything's close in Boston. It's a postage stamp compared to, you know, New York. But all the, I didn't say anything. I'm driving and this guy's, and, he's, and I could feel the, it's the energy, the seething or whatever. And then obviously he turns to me and goes, I, I, I got to do it like this because they get the side. He goes, you want to be a wise guy? Huh? You want to be a tough guy? You want to be a, you want to be a gangster? How oh, that fucking works. Fucking idiot. You no. Know, he's driving like this, you know? Every once in a while, he'd stop and, you know, out of the blue, he'd go, a fucking gangster. You want to be a gangster? You want to stand in front of the club like you're a fucking tough guy? How old are you? How old are you? I'm 16, 17. I was a fucking millionaire at 16. A fucking millionaire. Go to work. Nothing. Don't say anything. These fucking guys are crazy, right? The old lady goes, by the time I was 25, I was fucking broke. Go to fucking work. Fucking idiot. Give me gang stuff. Gang. Look at me. I'm a tough guy. I'm a gang. 30, I was a millionaire again. This fucking thing went on. I heard this guy's life story. How many millions he won, lost, made, but, but it all came down to go to work, go to fucking work. Uh, anyway, so that's where that whole fucking story came from in that situation. So many of these things came from my life, these moments. So, so, so I grew up around these guys. I, I always felt like, I always felt like I, I, I saw the irony, you know, and I wasn't an educated kid, you know, and, but I had an instinctive sense of irony and so forth where something would come on the news, you know, a guy, somebody robbed a 7-Eleven type store and they killed somebody. And I'm sitting there's a bunch of, and these aren't even, these are not, there's associates, but these were, some of these guys are stone cold wise guys, made guys and all that. And uh, something would come on the news and all of a sudden they go, fucking disgusting. Where's the fucking law? What are they doing? These pieces of shit. They fucking, bro. Uh, you know, why don't they need more fucking police around here? They got no, what the fuck are they doing? Why aren't they doing their fucking? I'm thinking to myself, am I crazy? Are these fucking wise guys? Are they yeah. <laughs> more law? Get more law? Get these yeah. fucking, yeah. Because, you know, the, the, this twisted, uh, you know, morality. And, well, we and see it on, we see it on the show all the time with, the religion and this and Tony after he gets shot and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But how do you make that jump, Frank, from yeah. the projects, hanging around wise guys, working in the social club to get what made you want to be an actor? Is I mean, what, was there a moment where you could have gone that route? Like Sirico, oh. I remember, said to me. They wanted to make him at some point because he was he was a driver and he ran errands for a guy and they wanted to make him. And he said, I'm not good at taking orders. And then they said, well, then you definitely shouldn't get made. Well, that would be the that would be low on my list of reasons not to get made. But, you know, not taking orders. But um, was there these opportunities that they come my way? Would it have, I could have gone down that route. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't get. I swear, I was like a fly on the wall sometimes. They forgot. I've been, I was there since I was like literally 13, maybe around them. I had a key to the club and, and, and they would forget I was there. I'd hear these conversations and, and some things I didn't want to fucking know and I knew, you know? So, and when I would go out into the neighborhood, you know, there was my, my, my friends from the projects and around the area. And, and there was that kind of, unspoken jealousy that I could go in the club. I was quote unquote connected, that bullshit, you know? 
And they were like, you know, a couple of guys were like, you know, you know, you tell, you think I'm afraid of that fucking guy? You think I'll go fuck, come to go fuck, I'll, I'll fuck, I'll fucking kill him. I break his fucking head tomorrow. And I would always go, go tell him. Fuck you telling me for it. Go tell him. You know, I, you're a tough guy. Go tell him. You know, and that would always shut them down. Did you start acting in Boston or was that when you went to New York? Yeah, it was actually Boston. I started in Boston. It was, but you got to understand, of course, the world was so different then. There was virtually nothing in Boston remotely resembling Hollywood or anything like that. And it was all theater. So ironically, I was a theater douchebag, as I should say. You know, I, I threw myself into the acting side of it and uh, worked really hard at it in Boston. And uh, it was some reality scam. You look, I, I remember working on my accent. I don't know if you guys ever did that, <laughs> you know, trying to, you know, muffle that ooh, Italian American neighborhood sound. Yeah. And I was walking around trying to articulate and draw the rock. And it didn't matter because uh, they just, it was like Comedia de Latte, the old, you're the, you're the fucking chef. You put the chef's hat on. That's as deep as your character is going to get. You're the cop, you put on the police uniform. You look like you look, you're going to be the wise guy, you're going to be the, the thug, you're going to be, you know, it didn't matter. Unless you did theater. And then, and not even mainstream, you had to look for the, the off-Broadway shows and stuff that you might have a shot at, you know? Michael, didn't you run your own theater? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I started producing theater when I was in my early 20s with a company and then my wife and I in like 2004 during the Sopranos we built a theater but um I started that the, the first company that I started came out of my acting classes which started at Strasburg and then I had a teacher that broke out of there but uh you went to New York moved to New York to kind of further your career is that what happened you just felt Boston yeah. there were limited opportunities yeah, so you no, you know what I I was literally you know I forget, 24 or so, 25, I'm not even sure how fuck old I was. But I was with a friend, it was like 3, 4 in the morning. It just, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I felt like I was already too fucking old. And I, and I thought, you know, no one's going to fucking come to my door, knock on my door and go, hey, Frankie, we need you in Los Angeles. So we need you in New York. This, this business can't go on, but, you know, that type of thing. And, and he convinced me, you get the fuck out of here. And the thought of leaving my neighborhood was just so scary. Mm. It was frightening to me. I didn't think I could do it. And I, and I, I, it's a long meandering story, but I hooked, hooked a ride to New Jersey. I have family in New Jersey. I crashed with my cousin for like a week, two weeks. He said, and I went into the city every day looking for a place to stay stumbled on the YMCA. It was, uh, it, it's just one of those uh, boring to other people's stories, you know. So, that, so, Frank, the first thing that you get, is it the Woody Allen movie? I was doing a lot of extra work, you know, uh, which I always tell people, you, you know, whether it's union, non-union, at that point, I, I was non-union, you know, and, uh, do, you know, just to learn what the fuck a set is, you know, and, and, you know, learn the, the you know, the, the lingo, lingo. And oh, I never fucking, hey. how did you get into writing? When I was in New York, I, 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 I hate it. First of all, everything was fucking homework to me. I hate having to write back then, especially. And I, I, I went to a, a production of a one act play, you know, and, I wish I could remember the name of the, the group, but it had an Italian affiliation. And uh, so I, went, I was impressed by that. And I said, well, I'm going to try to write my own one-act play. And I wrote a few one-act plays, and, but I would never show them to anyone. And I met this woman, Joanne Tedesco. She read my uh, one-act plays, and she thought she saw something, and she encouraged me, encouraged me to write. And I did more of that while pursuing acting career, an acting career. But I don't have to tell you guys how difficult that was, especially in New York, because, you know, you're only going to go for thug number one, thug number two. Then, you know, it's amazing, you, Michael, you know, Goodfellas and all that stuff. That's a, that, that was like a break, big, big break. 
but to get to read for that, million to one. So, you know, I got really, really uh, disillusioned with that in New York. And I was there for almost five years or so. Lived in Manhattan, then I moved to Brooklyn. So, uh, so Frank, how do you get How do you eventually meet David Chase? How do you get involved with The Sopranos? Uh, it's, uh, I'll jump to, I had, I had a writing career building and I met, I met with David Chase. I don't know, remember what the circumstances were, but they sent me the script. And I actually said to my wife, I said, Jackie, this, my wife, Jackie, it's a Jackie. This script's got something. I mean, this is, it's, it's, it feels right. It's something right. I mean, the execution's going to be big. I got to see the, the pilot. Um, knowing David at, not knowing David at the time, knowing of him now, I want to say it wasn't locked, but it must might have been locked. I, I don't know, but I don't think it was locked. But anyway, I saw it, and I saw, and I saw what I, what attracted me, of course, was you guys, the ancillary, at the, and the pilot, which were more ancillary, you know. And uh, I met with them. I met with them in uh, Santa Monica for coffee. And as you can see, I'm a kiakiron. Once I start talking, you got to fucking hit me with a pipe. And I saw right away that really irritated. <laughs> really fucking irritated. And uh, what did I got a call from, uh, from David Kelly. So David Chase called David Kelly after our meeting. I guess he said to David Kelly, I like this guy and, and uh, you know, but how do you get him to stop talking? And David <laughs> Kelly said, tell him stop talking. But I mean, then he approached me and said, I, you know, you want to do this? And I said, yeah, yeah. I, I, first time I said yes to anything that was of this ilk. But were any, was of the, any of the characters, were there characters that were your creations that you came up with? characters that you introduced oh, yeah oh my god uh, i think there was bobby bacala bacala i heard that yeah, yeah. ah okay yeah that's cool thank you uh, thank you for that friend. there you go thank you richie april uh richie april uh well my own to me i i, I would have to look at was, richie, you, uh, was richie april based on a combination of people, specific guys. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, you go ahead. Like, uh, like my 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 son's godfather, bless his soul, was a guy who was in this world. His name was Albi Sacramoni, and, and so I wrote the character Albi Sacramoni, but that name didn't clear because it was an Albert Sacramoni. It ended up Johnny Sack, you know. That's how it ended up Johnny Sack. And there was another, there's another guy, but I don't want to say his name. He's still with us. Uh, but he, uh, he got out of jail after 10 years, eight years in, in federal can. And uh, this guy knew my whole life since I was a kid. And he had, he was so fucking angry. He had, where guys moved, you know, evolved all the, those eight years it was one. One got of the guys, rich. Guys got rich, right? Yeah. One of the guys, one of the guys, his name was Buster So Fat Nicky, who was another big character in my life, one of the smartest men uh, streetwise anyway that I've ever met. And he had the funniest fucking turn of phrase. But uh, uh, but Nicky used to always go, whenever we went for if pizza or whatever, fat Nicky would go like this. This stealing money. This is stealing fucking money. Pizza. You understand this cost 30 cents to fucking make. You know how much we're getting banged for this fucking pizza? You know. Anyway, when that other guy, let's call him Anthony, gets out of, the, gets out of jail. When he went to jail, Fat Nicky was sort of uh, just hustling and all these different things, racetrack stuff. And uh, when he got out of jail, <laughs> Fat Nicky had pizza joints around the fucking city. He had gotten off. Anthony couldn't get that out of his fucking craw. This motherfucker, he's a, this, he owes me and da 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 da. So he became uh, uh, in his crosshairs. He was going right after him. He wanted to shake him the fuck down. He wasn't a made guy. That became uh, Beansy. Beansy. 
Angie with the uh, beach. Yeah. Angie, right? And so there was that that anger, that sort of, and that was the way. This guy, all right, I'm going around the circle, but this guy, Anthony, you didn't want to get threatened by him, not just because he was a scary guy, but it took fucking 20 minutes just to tell you, to tell you that he was angry at you because of the way he talked. And he would say, Cheech, Cheech, ah, you, uh, I don't know that you, uh, you have to start uh, thinking, uh, and I'm going, what the fuck? It's going to take forever. He had that intensity. Well, the, the, Richie Aprile was one of the scariest, if not the scariest yeah. character and, of all. all the but I have to tell you what happened. This guy gets out of the can after eight years. It's just all, it's all flooding back to me. And he was getting rid of all his wardrobe because he had, he had lost so much weight in the can. He wasn't that big of a guy, but still he also. So he came to, to, to who became... Uh, was it Johnny Sack? Is that his name? Johnny Sack? But yeah. Albie. It was Albie Sacramone. He came to Albie. Albie had a little joint that he rented, a breakfast joint. He says, Albie, I get this fucking beautiful jacket. doesn't fit me anymore. And Albie said, what are you doing? I want you to have it. Oh, geez, thanks, thanks. It was a leather Albie, jacket? The jacket. That's the leather jacket. The jacket. Yeah. The story is Albie, Albie comes to me and goes, what am I going to do? This fucking guy's in this jacket. I'm not going to wear this fucking jacket. It's like a 1960s, you know? And I go, what the fuck? Well, you know, you got to wear it. I'm like, I don't have to wear it. Just don't wear it. But every time Anthony came into his breakfast joint, he'd go, I'll bet, Albie, I'll bet. The fuck? You never wear my jacket. I give you that nice jacket. I never see you wearing it. He goes, oh, I got it. I got it. I was going to wear it. I wore it yesterday. Well, you weren't around. I was, I went. This became this fucking ridiculous thing about this jacket. And I was getting fucking antsy about it. I got to wear this fucking, I'm going to get killed with a fucking jacket. I'm, I, I'm insulting him. I go, well, where the fuck? He goes, listen, JG he goes, you know this fucking neighborhood. If you leave your car door open for 10 minutes, forget it. It's cleaned up, right? Doors and windows I leave open. I left that fucking jacket right there. Leather jacket. I couldn't get it fucking stolen. No one would stand. I was afraid I'd come back, my car would be gone, and the fucking leather jacket would be there. I can't get rid of this fucking jacket. And so this leather jacket became a fucking big thing. What Albie ended up doing, he went to the St. Vincent de Paul. You know St. Vincent de Paul box? That's like the, 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 in Boston, the church, you know, clothes. In the box, you throw the clothes in there. He threw the fucking leather jacket. What the fuck? Now, you write this, and people go, get the fuck out of here. Because it, it really happened. It really ha- doesn't mean it's, you know, believability is more important than reality. I was right there, witness this. I'm sitting in Albie's fucking breakfast joint. Who comes walking in? Anthony, the guy who gave him the little jacket. As we're talking, eating like that, slowly walking by the window is this fucking homeless guy. Wearing the fucking leather jacket <laughs> right outside the fucking window. He got it out of the poor box. And I'm going, oh, my Lord, to me, this could be fucking unbelievable. And Albie was fucking sweating like this big. But that, that's what really happened. Well, they had it. The maid's husband got it, which was. Is that good, what it was? Yeah. I, you know, so much of that stuff. Tony's maid's husband got the housekeeper's husband wound up wearing it. But it was. Uh, uh, Oh, it's I interesting mean, to hear the origins of these. Oh, there's so many. That, one, I, there's so many that I wanted to do that that David chose not to do. I want to say one thing before, if you, you know, uh, because of uh, you know uh, Jimmy. I mean, the passing of Jimmy was so so fucking. I can't imagine. I you, I know you guys would. would destroyed by it. But you, you know? kept in touch with him after the show, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's the thing I want to say. You know how they say the fifth Beatle? I was like the eighth Beatle because we wrote we wrote the first season from here, Santa Monica. I was out here mostly. And so, yeah, so as a result, you know, I would like Stevie uh, Stevie Van Zandt and, and I, when he'd come out here, we'd go and hang out. And every once in a while with Jimmy, I'd get together and have Dinner with Jimmy and, you know, and uh, Frankie's, I think, you know, Frankie's, right? Uh, 
Yeah, sure, I mean, sure, sure, sure. I right, know well, Yeah, it was like a good place to like to be low uh, out of the, you know, a couple of times. Said, Let's go to Marza. You know, Jimmy said, Marza, you're the fuck out. We're going to do Marza. <laughs> He was such a fucking, I can't tell you how many times people in those places would come up to him. And, and, and when he got the operation on his knee, yeah, he was in fucking pain. He had, the, he was on the gimp, you know, and uh, people come up to him, you know, autograph type of thing. And, they, and he was in pain. He, so, so nice. Very, very all the things you'd want somebody you you know from afar. If I were a fan, you know, you'd want absolutely, to see. absolutely. So many times it's not that way, you know, with other people. Yeah, I know you've sure. yelled at a lot of people. He sure. was a great dude, man. We miss him a lot. He was yeah. a good guy. Who, who did you enjoy writing for? Which character was your favorite to write for, Frank? <clears throat> Honestly, this I'm, I'm, I'm glad I said. Well, of course, uh, you know Tony and and everybody. I mean, literally everybody, but. But, you know, you guys, I, I related to in such a way more than others. But this, I think, was kind of a bonus for David Chase. He may uh, disagree, but it was, uh, the bonus was that, you know, at a serious moment here for a second, you know, my mother had mental illness. Uh, so uh, therapy I was very familiar with personally and and having a mother like Livia in many ways. So the attributes that Livia had was truly a, an amalgam of David Chase's mother, uh, Robin Green's mother, Robin was great, and my mother. My mother was the acerbic end of it. Another, another real life example, visiting my mother at the nursing home, but she was at the, the senior home, and uh, these are things that ended up in some form or another in scripts. And I'm saying goodbye to her. I'm in the doorway. And as I'm there, I hear this woman walking with the walker, an old woman that lived in the building. And I said, hello. And my mother go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, Mary so-and-so. And she'd say, my mother said, my mother could do, only two people could do this. I always said, Mike Starr, you guys know Mike Starr? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mike Starr. Mike Starr could do this, and my mother could do this incredibly. Insult a person to their face or talk about them to their face, and not they don't realize it, that they're being, you know. So my mother would go like this. My mother would go, oh, how are you? you you're doing good looking. Mental illness written all over his face. <laughs> uh, how are you going that? You know, just like that. Mumble. So this one, hey, Mary, I, uh, it's my son from California. Degenerate gambler, this bride. Look at her. She did all her money goes to the cost. <laughs> Livia definitely had. Uh, yeah, that in her. that type of thing. And there's another well-known moment from my life was it was in my mother's apartment in the senior apartments, and she heard something in the wall, like she's and it's a, a fucking water with this lady. She's always running the water. All oh, right, that was oh, Livia. She dumped it in. That water, how much fucking water do you need? I found, you know, so, I mean, I can go on for days on my mother. And that's what, the other thing was Melfi doing, which I love doing the Melfi scenes, you know, uh, because I was so familiar with the, uh, you know, that type of stuff. But all you guys, I mean, writing for everybody. Um, well, well, listen, I, Frank, we really I'm not appreciate it. More. I need something more. I'm not, you can't get rid of me. We're I want to. <laughs> we got Terry went to told me that you got a cash gift, uh, and that's what I want. Fuck these headphones. <laughs> We're just gonna send a cash gift as Steve is putting it in an envelope right now. It's got I your give name our boost. Frank, yeah. thank you, thank that you very fantastic. much. Great Listen. seeing you again, man. Thank yeah. you, thank you for having us, uh, for coming on. We really thank this, you guys. This, uh, this podcast would not have been complete without you doing this episode. So we're really happy we got you in. Thank you. Well, man. I'm, I listen, it was an honor to, you know, not, you know, to write and have you guys read those lines, do those lines, even though, you know, Michael fucked them up pretty much. But A little he, bit. You know, <laughs> I, nobody's perfect, Frank. No, you, oh, by the way, but real quick, you you wrote an episode and you, you wrote, you had your father's nightmare, I think it was, in there. 
Remember that? It's yeah. great. Okay, but your father and being stuck with a bunch of Irish guys or something. And, I wasn't my father. I just made it up. Oh, I thought you said it. Oh, oh, because there was something about that that fucking yeah, killed me. I, uh, St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, man, I hope I see you soon. Yeah. yeah listen, if we come out there, there or you get, come, a hold of you. get to New York, let us know. Yeah, yeah. Keep in and, touch. Uh, yeah, and you guys stay safe, stay, all stay right. healthy. And uh, my love to all, anybody you meet, see that I know, you know, from the show. All Thank right, you. brother. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Take care. The great Frank Renzulli, Frank ladies Renzulli, and gentlemen. Huge part of the Soprano legacy. Great, great, great story. talking to him. Great Let's take story. a break and move into the rest of our show. Another great guest. Another one. This is an all-star show, man. All-star. This is an interesting guest because he's not a filmmaker, right? Per se. You know, he's uh, he actually is an actor, but he he's not known for filmmaking. He's not known for, for directing or writing. Uh, yet, he was a very, very, very important part of the show. An indelible part of the show and in people's mind and in people's memory about the show. And still is. And still is, 100%. And, and, and will be 50 years from now. Because yeah. when they hear that song, they immediately brings them back to a time and a lot of memories. And you yeah. hear the song, you go, I remember watching this every Sunday. My family, my father, the kids, and on and on and on. I mean, it's, you know, immediately, right? 100%. Uh, he was born in London, England. He's a very successful composer, musician, and actor. His band has released six albums, and his music has been featured on a number of films and TV shows. Best known for his work with the band Alabama 3, who created the theme song for The Sopranos, Woke Up This Morning. He's also known as Larry Love. Please welcome a very talented and good guy, Mr. Rob Sprague. Sorry, there sorry. he is. Rob, how, how you doing, doing buddy? How you doing, fellas? Would How's you rather us call you Rob or Larry? Well, uh, my missus says I'm Larry after midnight and Rob till 10, so it's up to you. I don't know what time it is in America. If I'm Larry, then I'll Rob. And who are you between 10 and 12? <laughs> um, Harry. <laughs> Rory. Uh, thanks for coming <laughs> on. Um, you know, we mean it when we say... Your work is a, you know, it's it's a huge, huge part of the show. It just and it's part of the like Steve was saying, the, in the memory, in the DNA. And when people think of the show, it's just it's inextricable. I, I mean, honest fellas, I have I, I have no idea that the longevity and the integrity of this show were gone for so long and that we, we have in this relationship. And, you know, I was reading in the New York Times the other day about our young people during lockdown were getting back into Sopranos again. I mean, I'm just, I'm so honored. I'm, on a, I'm, a, I'm a Welshman living in London who wrote a oh. song for one of the most successful American mafia situations ever. You know, I mean, it's, oh. it's, it's, it's crazy. And I'm so, I'm so honored. I just can't believe that there's the longevity of this project, you know. Tell, tell us, two, I want to know what, two things really. The first is, how did you write the song? What's the song about? What was the origin of the song? And part B is, how did, how did it become the soprano theme song? Well, initially, um, we, we were in the kind of involved in the kind of house dance kind of techno scene. And I used to loop up like Howling Wolf sample going, woke up this morning, a 10 minute kind of acid house track. And, uh, and I started thinking, why don't we turn this into a kind of song about something? And then there was a case in London of this woman called Sarah Thornton, um, who'd been involved with uh, her husband was a police officer who'd been uh, for many, many years beating up proverbial out of her you know and she one day turned and she shot him and i thought instead of writing a song about a man being like well God, God, i'll put it from the point of view of a woman so i wrote the song originally about a woman who had enough of her husband and she blew his fucking head off whoa blew, so it wasn't written so it wasn't written for any mafia or gangster thing it's about a, empowerment of a woman you know and uh what was what was wicked um when David heard the song, apparently this is, I don't know this is myth or not, but he said he, he, was, he told me this when I met him uh, years ago. He said, I was driving down the you know, New Jersey freeway, whatever it was, and the song came on the radio at the time. And he said, 
they were looking for tracks on it. It, it, it fitted perfectly, you know. And he, and he said it was quite weird because he thought, man, these band boys are going to be American. He thought we're from Alabama because we're Alabama. Then he, he thought we're from Ipy, San Francisco. The best thing he thought we're three black kids from the Bronx. And he finds out ultimately that it's a Welshman and Scotsman in London pretending to be gangsters. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, you know, it's almost, the song is almost like it was written for the show, not it's, the other way around, right, Michael? Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was like, you know, this is the song. If they, there's somebody hired you and said, yeah, here's the first episode, write a theme song. That's what it seems like, you know. Now, well, that, that, that was what was so beautiful. And that, and, you know, the, the issue is as well, I mean, I think what was good, because he'd written from a point of view, and the first line is, your mother always said you'd be the chosen one. And I was writing a point of view of a woman, but it fitted perfectly with the narrative of Tony and his mother right. as well. Do you know what I mean? Right. That first opening line, Mama always said you'd be... And I wrote about it, but that, that strange synchronicity. I mean, the, the stars were aligned that night, you know what I mean? And David, God bless him for choosing us. I was so honoured, you know? Wow, that's really interesting. So and he... He was driving in a car, heard the song, and then you guys got contacted through what? Through your management or agent or something? Yeah, yeah. Have and, you uh, ever no. met David? Yeah, we met David. He came to, he came to see us in, uh, I think we were playing the Bowery. But we did, you got to bear, my, where we was in, in the UK, HBO was seen as a small cable channel, yeah? You know, okay. cable channel was not seen as no big thing. It wasn't until the Sopranos that eight cable channels kicked off. So our daft manager at the time was like, ugh. Yeah, Rob, uh, there's this call off a small cable channel advertise underpants and kind of, you know, you know, fishing equipment. And uh, they, they just want to use this song for something. And we went, yeah, didn't think anything more of it. Six months later, people are ringing from New York, got these massive billboards and surprises that kicked right off. So we had no Scooby Doo of it. I don't think you lot knew how big it was going to be. And it just escalated. No. No, in HBO, there hadn't been TV series. For actors, it was like, do a series on HBO really wasn't. A, a big, there was not a, an allure to it at all. Yeah. No. Well, I think we were really all surprised. I mean, the quality of Sopranos took HBO out of the kind of that, you know. Sure. Larry, please tell me that you got rich from this. Please tell me. Um, not. If you do, not, okay. Could have been a bit more rich. We're doing all right, yeah. The initial, the initial deal, the initial deal was a bit codswell because our manager didn't know anything about it, and he, you know. But yeah, we've been over the years because of the success of it. We've been all right. We've done good, you know. And okay. Got, you know, got, you know yeah. I have got a swimming pool, but I got a kind of, you know, I've got access to a <laughs> Cadillac. I, I got, I'm happy to hear that because yeah. it really is the song. It's one of those songs, as so many are, you know. You hear the song and. Uh, People's ears perk up. People think back to Sunday nights, parties, their family. It really is iconic as the show. The show is probably, if not the greatest TV show in history, certainly one of them. And Steve, uh, that's why I'm so I'm so honored, you know, and I can't believe I had that luck and fortitude to be. And it's it's a gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? Sure. You know, what did you think I, when you first saw? the song used in those title credits the very first time they sent you a cut or i'm assuming they sent you a v video or something what what was it like seeing that what did you think the, to be honest michael the first thing i know is being a stuck up fucking musician i was going david they sped me up a bit and beaten off you know to make it a bit more tension ah, <laughs> ah. but you know what that gives it the tension the fucking the sound editors are sweet, so i'm a bit more high pitched and everyone's going to me yeah, you don't sing like that, you sing like that. I said, he pitched me up. So, no, but once I got over the fact that I've been pitched up, I was like, I was blown away. You know what I mean? It looked great. I don't know if you've seen a video where we spoofed, Alabama 3 spoofed. We got exactly the same car Tony did. And we got a Tony lookalike in a car, driving around South London doing exactly the same scenes, mimicking the same opening shot, you know. But yeah, it was it was quite, but again, I didn't really, well, I was on tour at the time, and I didn't really, because it was, again, it's was prejudice, it was a cable channel thing, you know what I mean? Exactly. There was a real bad stigma about cable, so it was just like, oh, yeah, really good. I didn't even, it took me a couple of years to understand this, how blessed he was, you know, because I was a stupid musician, you know? You didn't think a lot of people would see it, probably? Well, not really. The way it was pitched to me, Michael, was my manager, who was not good at managing, he was our first manager, you imagine, he's a bit cretinous. He's going, no, it's just a cable. So he put us off, you know, we didn't know this. Right. And, uh, but I like that, you know, to, to, 
which is what's something beautiful for Sopranos over the UK, the way it's built up from a cult following. We started so small. That's give us all loads of credibility in it. That, you know, David and you lot took the fucking gamble and it built and built and built. And I think that's part of the love for the show. Do you know what I mean? Yes. It was the fundamentals of it were formulated on integrity and just we're going to do what we're going to do and see how, what happens. And that's giving it strength now. And, you know, there's so many programs that end up so formulaic without that energy, you know. We're fly, flying by the seat of our pants and you've got a poxy UK band introducing the, the show. You're mad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, Rob, did, did, did it help you as a band touring? Were you drawing bigger crowds? Were uh, more opportunities coming to you uh, once the song, the show became massive, season two, three? You know, I mean, it was really a huge following. Did it help you with any of um, that stuff? Yeah, Steve, I mean, it's not, I mean, some people say we're too cool for school. I didn't want to go around shouting about it. The same way you got, you know, Sopranos is cool, Alabama 3 are cool. So we didn't want to milk it too much, you know what I mean? And we let people come to us. I've quite enjoyed not, you know, flash, being too flashy with it. And, you know, because it's not, I, you know, no offense to the people who do the music with friends or stuff like that, but I wouldn't want to be a, a fan of the friend soundtrack people, you know what I mean? I understand, I understand, <laughs> you know. No, so, but it did help the band. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, Steve, yeah. you're right. What I'm saying is, it was it was a it was an entree position. You know what I mean? It was something that could draw the band in. You know what I mean? So, and I was, people say to me, "Are you ever bored of playing it?" No, because we've never really tarted it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We've never kind of gone too mad about it. We kept it cool to our chest, you know, and keep it fucking tight. It's yeah. just out respect for you lot as well. You know, you know the shows about an underground kind of collective of you know hooligans, a bit like Alabama Three. You know? Exactly. That's exactly what we were. Does it get a reaction from the fans when you start playing it? Oh, yeah. I mean, now, I mean, you've got to bear in mind, we were playing the song five years before the show kicked off. And then suddenly, every time we played that song, the, the crowd would go mad. So, you know, but yeah, it was, it was really nice you know, said, watching that crowd develop and know the track, you know. Yeah. Because we, cool. we, hadn't, you know, we hadn't released it, promoted as a single or Sopranos thing, you know. Kind of, you kept it real. Yeah. Yeah, which is, I think, a good idea. What's, uh, who's Larry Love and why? I don't know why I'm Larry Love. Mike. Why are you got your name in it? I just... <laughs> I is, it a, is it a different act? Do you release, do you have a different, a side project, like no, a different I, band or that kind of thing? Yeah, I've got, um, I've got, um, Larry Love's just my name is Leeching Alabama 3. I've got a solo project, O'Connell and Love, um, got three or four different projects, but that name is kind of stuck with me, you know what I mean? Yeah. My kids are like, Dad, you have to be called Larry Love. <laughs> you know, I'm always a 12-year-old in South Philly. He's like, Dad, why are you Larry Love? Right. Well, remember what, uh, Jerry Lewis, the nutty professor. Body yeah. Love, right? Body Love. Body yeah. Love. <laughs> are you still touring with Alabama 3? You guys still go Wait. out? Steve, we're trying to win it, but it's COVID. We've just come out, well, we've, we've done about eight gigs now. We've got a tour coming up. We've got a new album out and the one called Step 13, you know. So, uh, yeah, we're pretty busy with the pandemic and hopefully we're going to America soon, you know. Oh, good. Yeah, and there's a website. You have a website? Yeah. so Because uh, we yeah. got a lot of listeners all over the world. So, uh, yeah, what's the website? Alabama3.com UK. Well, listen, we're going to be... Uh, I think uh, June 12th, we open at the London Palladium, if I'm not mistaken, and we're 16 cities. So uh, let's connect. You'll be our guest. We'd love to see you at the show. We do a comedy and conversation thing, and we'd love, and I'm sure our fans would love to say hello to Larry Love slash Rob Sprague. You could bring either one. <laughs> I could bring, I might have the third party side of me then, isn't it? Why is this three of me? Can I be plus three? You know, exactly. after midnight, they call me Stevie Love. <laughs> Everybody's loving after midnight, Stevie. Hey, uh, Larry, Rob, thank you very much, man. It was wonderful talking to you. You're a good guy. Best of luck with everything you're doing. Thanks, Thanks for lot. coming on, man. You take care. Lots of love, man. Thank you so much. Real privilege, all right? Nice talking to you. Yeah. See you in the yeah. next year. Yeah. God take bless, care. man. Will do. Cheers. Very good. Thank you. There you have it, Rob Sprague. There he is, good guy, nice guy, and an incredible story.
Yeah. I mean, it really is an incredible story. David Chase, when we talk about right place, right time, Michael. That's David's it. David's driving the car. I mean, I never heard the song. I mean, before The Sopranos. No. Have you? No, not at all. He's listening to the song. You know, he's a music nut. Boom. It's a, it was like the song was almost written for it. It's. I also never knew it was about a woman. That's really interesting. I did really? not know that at all. Very, cool. very. Like I said, I'm glad they, they renegotiated the deal and he made some money because it is an iconic song. They even use it in the Many Saints movie. They use it in the Many Saints, yes, at the end. That's right. Very good. All right, let's take a break and get to our next guest. Our guest was born in Brooklyn has had a long career in television, on Broadway, in feature films. He's appeared in over 50 films and TV shows, including The Pope of Greenwich Village, The Departed, Kundun. I mean, these are giant classic movies here. The Last Dragon, Nurse Jackie, Blue Bloods. They work opposite me and Blue Bloods. The Sorcerer's Apprentice. He appeared in only one episode of The Sopranos. No, no. No. Why did, that's not true. Two episodes. So this... This note is wrong. Andy! He's in two episodes. It's fucking of Andy, ever since you put him on the air, he's never <laughs> been the same, this fucking guy. He's a slacker. I thought he was in more than one. I, okay, he so he's been in more than one. And he's a slacker. He, you know, listen, it's not easy. Believe me, it's probably not easy for Andy to do this. You think it's, <laughs> it's fucking not easy, easy for me? me. Uh, appeared in two episodes, but made a huge impression uh, as Sung Young Kim the boss of Tony Blundetto and the uh, dry cleaning business. Please welcome our good friend, Henry Yuck. Henry! There he is. Hey. hey, guys. How you doing, pal? Thanks for doing I'm this. Good. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate uh, it. It's my pleasure. Now, you were born in Brooklyn. You got a thicker Brooklyn accent than I do. Well, what accent? What are you talking about? <laughs> I, a lot of people, when they meet you after watching you on screen, must be pretty stunned by that. Well, you know, yes and no. I mean, uh, people who recognize me and either from Sopranos or from something else, they just kind of get into, or, hey, you were the Sopranos, and I just wave and say, hey, yeah, thanks, that kind of stuff, and then that's it. But, you know, we don't get into about, that's funny. You got this accent. <laughs> hey, Henry, of all the stuff you've done, and you've done a ton, uh, what do you get recognized from most? Sopranos. And by the way, I heard that you were saying I was on two episodes. It's one episode. One episode. It is one. So Andy was right. It was <laughs> one episode. All right. I take it's, it back. It, but a lot of people said, oh, you were on like two, two or three episodes, right? And said, no, but I think because the episode was so pivotal right. and really such a terrific episode and also probably like from the teaser and what happened last week and all that kind of stuff, um, people think of it as more than one episode. Yeah, and it was a big episode and a lot happened and you were in it a lot. I love, yeah. what did you call him, Blondino? <laughs> yeah. You, I love yeah. that. Blondino. That's what they wrote. Yeah, that's great. Now, did uh, you know Steve Buscemi before that, uh, Henry? I did not. Um, I'd seen him in, in many things, of course. Uh, and all my scenes were just with him. Oh, really? That was it. Yeah, it was you only didn't work him with anyone him. else. Oh, that's right. No, I, think about I was at the table read, and I met a few people at the table read weeks before, but it was just uh, me and Steve on set, you know, um, in our scenes. Um, so it was just really uh, kind of like a private shoot, almost. <laughs> I mean, and. Um, Peter Bogdanovich directed that episode. Ah, that's right. So, um, and so they were all great to work with, Peter, um, Steve. And Steve is nothing like what he appears in any of his work. You know, he comes off in movies and TV things as kind of this odd, weird, quirky guy, but he's really not like that. Um, he's just kind of like a normal New York guy. Um, 
so he's very different. He's very nice, very low key, really. And um, we had a good time doing it, you know. Um, Peter actually gave me a call maybe a week or two before we were getting on set. And it's funny, my, we were home, it was like on a Saturday, I think, because mo both my daughters were home at the time. My oldest daughter picks up the phone and they ask for me and I take the phone. And somebody says, can you speak to Peter Ogdonovich? He on time. And I say, yes. And my old daughter goes, who? And I said, it's Peter Bogdanovich. And she goes, <gasps> my younger daughter goes, who? <laughs> so, you know, it, it, we had a nice conversation. He just wanted to touch base, go over a few pointers and stuff like that on the scenes. Um, and when I was on set, he went through the scenes with me because one of the things he said early on was, we like what you did at the audition. Uh, we like the accent, but we still have to understand what you're saying. So we kind of just played around a little bit, to make it cleaner. Right. Um, That's smart. And so in the end, it was, um, you know, really working very, very specifically, uh, scene to scene, moment to moment. How did you get started in as an actor in show business? Well... I first started working with Pan Asian Repertory Theater. Um, I wasn't, I didn't start out as an actor like some of you guys who went to school and got training and stuff. Um, <clears throat> I fell into working with Pan Asian Rep. We did a lot of shows at La Mama. This is back in the 70s. Mm. So I was doing two, three shows a year with them uh, back then. After a while, I started trying to audition for things. And my first SAG movie was Eyewitness. Bill Hurt. And oh, Warner yeah. Weaver. That's a good movie. Uh, it was one of those. It was my first SAG job. And it was one of those. It, it, if I get through it, then that gets me the, my entree into SAG. All right. So it wasn't actually a speaking role. What was your first speaking role? Uh, very first speaking role. I, I don't actually remember which one was that. But the first kind of biggish movie was Last Dragon, which is the other thing that I get recognized for. Because that's like this cult classic. Mm. And you run into people who are all ages, and they say, you know, I was watching you with my mom. That's her favorite movie. Um, and so there's a, there's a big, big following, um, for the last dragon. How was that experience? Uh, couldn't do where, where did they shoot it? They shot that in Morocco. Wow. Um, there's a studio in Warzaza, uh, which is the other side of the Atlas mountains in Morocco. Um, they've had movie shooting there from what, uh, as far back as at least Lawrence of Arabia. Mm. and going forward. And um, so Marty Scorsese directed that. And he'd done a couple of other th films there also, I think. Um, Last Temptation he did there. Last Temptation yeah. was there. And I think maybe a couple of other things. But that was great. Um, the majority of the actors in that were really non-professionals, except for me and three other Chinese guys. The guy who played Mao, uh, two other uh, military guys. Um, all of us were from New York, but they had all these Tibetans, including um, background, flown in, and they lived in this compound in Morocco uh, for several months. Mm. So, um, so I thought what Marty did with, particularly with the kids, um, was quite remarkable. It's incre It's an incredible movie. How long? It how, is. How? Yeah, uh, it's really, it's really remarkable. How? How? How long were you in Morocco for that? I actually went twice. Um, 
I went one week, and I was there about a week. I, I shot a few days, came back like a month later, and did the same thing. Um, it was a really, really nice shoot because the, um, the crew was great. Um, it was different being in Morocco. Sure. Uh, uh, and so Marty Henry, was great. You've done a yeah. lot of theater, TV, movies. What, what do you prefer? What do you like best? One more than the other? or I started out doing this because I love theater. I got interested in high school, but I didn't pursue it after that because in the 60s, there were no role models. So I didn't do anything in college. I went to Brooklyn College. Shout Me out too. To Me too, school. Henry. Me too. It, yeah. So um, I didn't take any theater classes in Brooklyn College. Um, I went into education. And... I fell into the theater later on in the 70s when I was working downtown in Chinatown. And uh, how did uh, how did you wind up on The Sopranos? What was the, that? Uh, how did that happen? Well, typical uh, audition. And everybody, every Asian American actor I know auditioned for that. Um, it was a big deal role. Um, and it was a great role. It was well written. Um, just like the show itself. Um, so we went through the usual audition process. In fact, I had like, I think it was the third call match. Um, I got a call from Georgina Walken and she said, they're really interested in using you, but they're a little concerned because they saw that I had a little bit of a limp. This is, uh, I think we shot this in, 2004. Yeah. Mm. So um, I explained that it was a hip problem that I had had since adolescence. And for the most part, it was fine. Um, it didn't hurt so much. Um, and it didn't bother me or anything. And I explained that to her. So I came into that um, third callback. And everybody was there, David Chase, uh, Matthew Weiner, uh, Peter Abdanovich, a whole bunch of other people, uh, Georgina. And the first thing was they asked, um, are you injured? Because they were concerned if I had some kind of an injury or something and um, that I might hurt myself or whatever doing the, doing the episode. And I said, no, and I explained. Um, I said, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, as long as you're feeling okay, we were just concerned about that. And the implication was that they were concerned about my getting into the fight and getting beat up by Steve in the episode and how that might look to the audience. Yeah. So the implication was that they didn't want to see somebody who was perhaps disabled being beat up. So I'm thinking, you know, this show goes like way over bumping off people, blowing people away, throwing them in the trunk of a car, throwing them off a bridge, whatever. And you're worried if, if <laughs> it looked like a disabled guy is getting beat up. Uh, that's a lot. Of it, it? Yeah, that's, that is a little bizarre. But it didn't matter, right? It didn't. I mean, in the end, it was great. I, I did the fight scene, which was a lot of fun. I had a stunt double, um, and he only did one shot in it. Because the shot yeah. where gets pushed into the, the pool, the koi pond. And, and they had a wide shot of that, and they had him doing that. Everything else I did. The funniest thing is that the... the the double came in to makeup and they had to shave his head. And he was looking more and more nervous as they were working on the <laughs> shaving his head. But uh, it looked pretty good. You, uh, you I know, thought it looked great. Yeah. I, had, I didn't yeah. notice any limp. 
No, nor did I. Notice, uh, let, Henry, well, uh, what's your favorite role of all these roles that you've played? Your favorite, favorite role? Theater, movies, favorite? film, what? Uh, TV? Well, prob- I think probably this, um, because it was really written so well. Um, and I really got to do something on it. I mean, there's so many things where, you know, a day player, you get a... a one little scene, you get a couple of lines, um, and there's not much to do. But here, it was really something to do. Yeah, you had an, uh, a so kind then, of a complete arc, even within that yeah. one episode. It was beginning, middle, and end to his story. It was great. Yeah. Exactly. You were kind of grumpy. And, you were grumpy, your character. A, a little bit, but I mean, you know, the, yeah, the guy's grumpy. a businessman. Um, you know, he's got to do what he's got to do, you know. Um, but the other thing was Last Dragon because there I got to play this kind of very opposite character um, that you don't get to see because it it's three guys who own who, who work in a Chinese fortune cookie factory and I don't know if you're familiar with the film or not but the lead in it was a young black man who was trying to emulate Bruce Lee but he's kind of very straight laced um, and not your typical urban black kid. The three Chinese guys are trying to learn how to be black. So in a sense, they're blacker than he is because they're talking jive and everything like that. Um, so it kind of went against the grain of what Asian characters look like and play. Um, so we got to talk more like urban guys than um, typical Chinese guys. Um, in fact, when we shot it, when we, when we auditioned for it, we just went in and said, yo, what's up? You know, hey, how you doing? And when we went on set the first day, Barry Gordy was the producer. And they had us doing the first day shoot with the Chinese accent. And we were saying things like, yo, my man, what up? And we're going through <laughs> I'm assuming the it's a scene. It's a comedy. We're, we're, is this a comedy, The Last Dragon? Yes, yes. It's comedy. Yeah. Okay. It's a, it is a um, action Motown comedy, right? martial arts musical. No. And Vanity was the, the lead uh, love interest in that. Is that Prince, Princess? And, one of Princess Girls? Vanity? At the time, it, it was yeah. she was already former uh, girlfriend. Yeah, Michael uh, doesn't like Prince. That's not true. Michael that got the, the Prince, Prince. That is not true. I like Prince. Prince but, dissed him. Uh, he Prince. totally dissed me, but I do like <laughs> Prince. Henry, what's next for you? You got anything coming up? Uh, nothing. The only thing that might be happening sometime starting in fall, I was uh, working on a workshop of a a musical about Jewish refugee survivors in Shanghai during World War II. And I played a, a violin maker, a Chinese violin maker. And they've been developing this and they are hoping to uh, get it further along. We did a reading of it last year, uh, early in 20, before everything got locked down. Uh, they're rewriting, they um, have been tweaking and, and all of that. So that, that would be about it. Um, the last couple of things I did was I, was, I worked on um, Iron Fist, Marvel show, and uh, Warrior. So here I am playing two Tong leaders in two different centuries. <laughs> so Fantastic. some things don't change. Let's Some keep on going, Henry. Thank you very much for this. It's great seeing you again, and uh, we'll catch up and be Appreciate well. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for lot. coming on the Thank show, Henry. Thank you so much. See you. Very nice. Thank you. Very nice. All right, Henry Yuck, who Henry played Yuck. Uh, Sung Young Kim. Terrific he, actor. Terrific guy. Yeah. Sounds a little like Christopher Walken. He sounds a little like Walken. I was thinking the same thing. Sounds Amazing. a little like Christopher Walken. Um, Made a big impression in one episode. He's, yes, he, he did. Know, he really did. He's yes, very memorable he and, a, and, and a 
really solid, great, complete character. Yeah, when we worked together on Blue Blood, you know, Dominic graduated from Brooklyn College, Henry, Dominic Kianese, and me. Uh, when we worked on Blue Bloods, we had a lot of stuff together. We did. We worked right in Tribeca on Broadway. That was very good. Uh, very good. Let's uh, take a break and Lead let's back. get into the episode. You know, um, if David Chase was the Tony Soprano of the production, right? Correct. Our guest would be the Silvio Dante, the consigliere. Yes. Now, her title was producer and then executive producer. And that can mean a lot of things. But in this case, really, it was like this consigliere type. She was she wore a lot of hats even even under that umbrella of producer. She was involved in the production, in the pre-production, in post-production, in the promotion, in the awards, when when we would travel, in the casting, like um day-to-day -day stuff, also, nuts and bolts stuff. Yes. She's also the conduit between the actual Soprano show and HBO. And she dealt a lot she's with the network as well, big time. She's got to deal with the network. Yeah, yeah. so she really, uh, David leaned on her an awful lot, as did. She also had to deliver the bad news. If there was bad news, she was the one to got to go in to see The Wizard of Oz. We, uh, I want to I want to get news. into that today, too. She did. The, she, she fulfilled that same role on Girls for HBO with Lena Dunham as yes. well. A very talented TV and film producer. Graduated with a master's degree from Columbia. I believe she went undergrad to Brown. I'm pretty sure that's true. Was accepted to Albany Medical School, but did not attend. Started out as a production assistant on Crocodile Dundee, but has been an executive producer on 11 different TV series, including Mildred Pierce, Girls, Succession, Camping, The Nevers. Works a lot with HBO. I mean, she's become a real go-to producer for HBO. Nominated for 10 Emmy Awards, winning two of them, both for The Sopranos. Executive producer or producer on 86. All, that's all. That's the whole kit and caboodle. All 86 episodes of, of The Sopranos. Please welcome... Our good friend Eileen Landris. There she is. Hey, Eileen. Hi, Thanks for I wish doing I, this. Thank you. I wish I was smart enough to have gone to Brown. I, I, uh, why I do I think to, you I, went to Brown? I went to Union College in Schenectady, New York, which is which is like wow. actually really hard. But um, yeah. Uh, but then you went to Columbia. Then I went to Columbia. So you yeah. it was Ivy League at least. What what was yeah, your yeah, master's yeah. in? Nutrition. Yeah, that, that's really? a real that's a real good segue. Um, the first movie I ever 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 worked on was called Manja when they made it, and it was then I think when they released it, it was called <laughs> Eat and Run. It was it was a tiny 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 little no budget movie starring Ron Silver and um, a, a really sort of large guy. And the premise was it was a guy who came down from outer space and started eating all the Italians in Little Italy. That is truthfully like the plot of what this show was. And if he I ate like somebody, it. yeah, had eaten somebody and had spit, and you could tell he ate them because it spit their buttons out. So the segue <laughs> from like when I typed up my resume and it said things like you, I worked at, um, you know, the, the, I graduated the Institute from hum, of Human Nutrition. I worked at Columbia and St. Luke's in the Obesity Research Center. And then my first job was on a movie called Manja. And so. then you went on The Sopranos. Yeah, so it's, it's all very, you know. Which had its own eating thing. Yeah. We should pitch that as a series to HBO, the, um, <laughs> <laughs> the manja. I like manja. it. Uh, uh, isn't there a mention of Union College in the show somewhere? There is, Does and it's actually work? not. It, there isn't a mention of Union College. And actually, it's not even because of me. David Chase had a really good friend whose name I'm spacing on right now, who is a big television executive. He was like a president of a television studio or something that he had worked with. And he had gone to Union College as well. So for people that don't know out there, OK, what exactly was your job? I mean, we described it a little but Tell us exactly what you did on The Sopranos. I am what's known as a non-writing executive producer. Um, to translate what a non-writing executive producer does um, in the kindest of ways, this is in the most complimentary ways, I'm the sheep herder. You guys are the sheep, I'm the sheep herder. Sometimes I had good sheep, sometimes I had bad sheep. <laughs> and, 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 you know, <laughs> we'll never tell. There were, there were, it, it changed, it's changed to sort of season to season who the good sheep were and who the bad sheep were. So that's, <laughs> that's my job. <laughs> so you, that's had a good to, way to you had to make sure everyone stayed in line. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, some people say it's like herding cats. I think that's a little derogatory. I, I kind of, the, the sheep are sort of kinder and fluffier. Um, I don't know. I don't know about yeah, that. I think I'd rather say cat. I'd rather be a cat than cats. a sheep. Yeah, I, one of the ADs used to say puppies in a box. You know, that's another one. Um, <laughs> so I'm sort of the one who, um, you know, part of it's the good news person, part of it's the bad news person. You know, you sort of, uh, it, 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 it's, it's sort of if you, uh, how do you describe this? It, it's kind of good if you have a little bit of like attention deficit, sort of like I'm, I'm very bad at sitting and staring at one thing the whole time. Like I'd make a terrible script supervisor. But if you sort of want to like butt into this and butt into that and kind of like sort of juggle what's going on, that that's kind of what I do. And what, how, what was the journey from nutrition to film and television? I mean, how did that happen? Um, you know, I was supposed to be a doctor and I thought like, okay, I should, you know, that sounds good. I was really good in biology, kind of crap in physics and chemistry, but good in biology. And I was always sort of interested in it, but I also always really liked to go to the movies and I didn't know anything about working in film or television. Um, I just knew that when you watched a movie or TV show, there were credits at the end, there are people's names. And it's like, well, those people must have jobs. Like there must be some kind of job to do this. Um, and so <laughs> basically I, um, I deferred once I got accepted to medical school, cause you know, sort of, you know, Jewish doctor, you know, you're supposed to be a Jewish doctor. Um, although I think, you know, David probably hired me because he thought I was Italian. But yeah, yeah, you know, I I look Italian, but yeah. Jewish doctor. But so. uh, you did play a you did play a doctor. On I our did show. play a doctor, you, and I you did. were very good. And you were very now, good. Also, I think I was pretty terrible, which kind of solidified my career behind the camera. <laughs> I I thought of what what uh, season was that? Do you remember? Season four, I think. Right? Was it season four? I think it's so. when Uncle Junior has cancer. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you were great there. So, yeah. uh, okay, you were in. You were in. Now, did you make any creative decisions at all, uh, Eileen? I mean, I know maybe uh, of course a budget. You might say, well, we can't do this stunt or that, or. But I mean, were you? I know you were in the casting sessions because like, you were oh, there when I yeah. auditioned. Yeah, yeah. So I was always in casting. Um, you know. Production decisions are always creative decisions. In fact, uh, there's a line I used to, you know, use all the time um, when, you know, at the very beginning, when we started like the pilot, it was just, you know, myself and David Chase and, um, you know, a locations person, which, you know, changed depending on when it was. Um, and like Alex Zakharov, you know, scouting, you, there's like four people, five people scouting. And, you know, David would drive us around New Jersey and at point, you know, I didn't know New Jersey well. I, I you know, sort of fake that I kind of knew where things were because I had an old boyfriend from New Jersey, but I didn't really know New Jersey. So um, David would show me all these different things. And, um, you know, you, you sort of, hey, how about that? How about that? So you read the script and say, hey, that that seems like maybe we should do this over there or, or you know, that's a cool looking thing. What do you think of that? Um, so in terms of the creative part, th there became a thing as time went on that I would, you know, say to David and some of the other writers, I'd start the sentence with, because they'd always think that if I made a suggestion based on being the, in the job that I have as a, you know, sort of the, the, the non-writing side, um, is that if I was suggesting something, it's because it was less expensive. And that wasn't really yeah. the case. I, most of the time it was because I just creatively thought it was better. So I would start every sentence with, um, this might be more expensive, but. You know, this might cost a little bit more, but because they would just say, oh, well, if she's making the suggestion, it's just about budget. So I was like, no, it's like, I just think it might be a better thing to do. Did they, uh, did you weigh in on the casting? Were you, were you ever, did they say, what do you think? Or you just were an observer? Uh, oh, no. They, I mean, most of the casting was really David and the director, but you know, David, the director, George Ann, Sheila, myself, um, you know, depending on who wrote the episode, you know, they were in the room. And then, you know, later on, like Terry was there most of the time in casting. Um, yeah. I mean, it was a, it was a, I mean, you were in it. It's a brutal casting room. It was like oh, yeah. bright, you know, it was bright lights. It was, you know, bright fluorescent lights. You know, David, very stoic. You know, it was, it was a brutal room. <laughs> very intimidating. Yeah, yeah there was, was no very concessions room. for the actors to make them feel comfortable. Not at all. No. Not at all. And, no. and the funny part was what was good about that is that, you know, sometimes if casting is too warm and fuzzy, 
uh, then when the actors get to set, they panic. If you could make it through our casting room, you'd be fine on set. That, that's a yeah. that's a really good point. I didn't think about that. That's yeah. true. Very, very good. Because some You're people right would. That. They'd get to set and then all of a sudden there's James Gandolfini and whoever, J- J- Edie Falco, and people start to kind of wig out a little bit. Yeah, that yeah, can happen. Yeah, yeah. But like our, our casting room is like, uh, you know, George Ann could be, pre- they all could be pretty rough, you know. Um, it, it just, it was a, it was always, no matter where we did it, it was always pretty unforgiving space. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, as an actor, you start to just expect the worst for every audition anyway. So, you know, yeah. that's, that's at least how I, you know, started to think. It's like, okay, it's just going to suck the audition process anyway. So whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. the worst thing—the yeah, I mean, worst thing you could do, worst thing you could do in, in, when you go audition—is try to suck up to the producers, start name oh, dropping, yeah. or hey, we met, is that, right? Is it that bad, Eileen? Yeah. Like, hey, well, Eileen, like, I met you at the deli. You know, remember me? And yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I do remember. Um, you know, the the best was casting the pilot. I mean, Michael was in that room. It was on 70, West 72nd Street and it was a like a rehearsal space. And so you'd climb up a flight of stairs or two. And then there were people like tap dancing on our heads. And it was, uh, you know, it was a, a crappy little space. And But it really felt like uh, it felt like if you were writing a scene about a casting, an old time, old timey yeah. casting room. That's that's what it was. It like. was very uh, Broadway Danny Rose kind of that, yeah. that kind of vibe. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you remember? I mean, we've talked to obviously George Ann and uh, uh, Sheila about the casting. Do you remember any other people that were made offers to or David thought about casting? Was there anything that you remember like that that's a little unusual? Like I remember when they brought in James, when I said, you know, we're looking at Tony Soprano and all that. And uh, and they said, oh, yeah, this is guy, James Gandolfini. You've never heard of him. And I was like, no, actually, I have, have heard of him. I've worked with him before because I did a, um, a Sidney Lumet movie that he was in. I think it was one of his first films. Um, and, uh, he, he played like a thug. He had like a couple scenes and he played a thug. And he was also my cousin Mark's roommate in college at Rutgers. So really? when they said to me, Oh, you don't know Jimmy Gandolfini? I'm like, Yeah, no, he's Mark the chiropractor's roommate from Rutgers. Wait, which exactly Mark? Who he is. Mark who? Mark Olstein. Oh, that's your cousin? I didn't know that's that. That's my, that's my like second cousin. Yeah. My uh, Jersey, I have all these Jersey cousins. What was the name yeah. of the movie? Was the Sydney Lament movie? A stranger Among Us. Oh, that's right. Oh. It's a what? It's a really bad one where uh, Melanie Griffith goes undercover in the Hasidic in, Jewish in community. The, in the yeah. Hasidic community, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and and uh, and Jimmy played. Uh, oh God, he, he played like basically his line was, "I'm scared. I'm so scared." It was like he was playing a thug, and we ran a you know a truck into you know a truck through glass windows in the. Um, I, no, wait, what that's, okay, wait, I remember that scene. They ran, um, it was like the lift gate of a truck was open and they ran a car into the back of it. Wow. It was like on, four, it was like 47th Street. On the know, Diamond like District? Like the Jewelry District, yeah, yeah. Uh, how did you wind up on The Sopranos? Um, how did I wind up on The Sopranos? Uh, you know, I got a phone call um, one day from a guy named Dan Kaplow, who is, he's a producer, he does what I do now, but he was working at HBO and he called for my availability um, and I just had come back from doing a, a, a sitcom where we posted in LA and, um, they called me up and I just, I was like, a, it was like, I was a junior high schooler going, send me the script. And, and so it was like the, send me the script, whatever. Cause I, you know, just worked on some things like, no, you know, I'm not taking a job unless I really like the script. So it's funny. Cause now somebody just emails you a script, but back then it was FedEx to me. And I have no memory for so many different things. But for that one, I know exactly. I, I remember the FedEx envelope came. I remember ripping it open. And weirdly, I remember that I read the script laying diagonally on my bed. I do not know why I remember this detail. But I, oh, and I that's weird. read this. It's weird. And I read the script and I was like, oh, damn, this is this is good. So I called them back and said, oh, well, this is good. Um, I really like this. Sure. And I was pretty young and inexperienced, but I was like, sure. So then they called me a day or two later and they said, will you come to LA for a meeting? And I kind of went, send me a plane ticket. Cause I just come back from LA. I was like, send me a plane ticket. So they did. And I got on a plane and my interview for the job was kind of like, um, 
a scene from Sopranos. So I get off the plane. I like get the rental car. I drive over to HBO, which was in Century City. I change my clothes in the car. I run upstairs and there's nobody there. Like there's one assistant. There's nobody there for the interview. And then they say, oh, yeah, they move the interview because this is before like cell phones and pagers and all that kind of stuff. It's 1997. And I'm just getting off a plane. So they're like, yeah, they moved it to Brillstein Gray, Brad Gray's office. Do you know where that is? So they gave me an address. I get my little rental car and I drive from Century City to Beverly Hills. And I go in and it's this like, you know, fancy, kind of fancy, you know, very tasteful room that they walk me into. And I just remember the windows were like kind of a row across the top. They were kind of high up. And David was sitting at a desk and he was kind of like the light was sort of coming through, sort of very cinematic. And um, there are a bunch of other people there. And I walked in and it was, you know, felt a little bit like an interrogation, um, but it was good. And then afterwards, they said to me, well, can you stick around and like meet some other people here? And I'm like, you pay for the plane ticket. You're paying for the Chateau Marmont. You're paying for the rental car. Sure, I'll stick around and like talk to whomever. Just thinking that there's no way I was going to get the job because um, I was pretty young and inexperienced. <laughs> um And then the next day, um, David called me for some names of some like, uh, cinematographers because he was really into independent film then thinking that I really came from independent film. And I'd worked a little bit independent film, but, um, you know, realistically, no, I'd mostly worked on big studio films, but I came from film, not really too much from television. Um, and so, you know, down the line when, when David did hire me, um, he said to me at one point, you know, I hired you because you're not ruined by television because my, you know, my background was in film. And then, you know, many years later, when he's going to make a movie, he goes, well, you know, I, I, you know, now you're ruined by television. I'm like, well, if I'm ruined by television, you know, you ruined me. But um, I look at it as ruined by television in a much different way, which is, you know, after working on The Sopranos, it's very hard to work on anything else. Yeah. 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 And that and- makes sense. When I know we get asked this question all the time, like, when did you know it was going to be a big hit? When did you realize we're on to something here? You know, it's kind of this weird thing where a lot of times you work on something and it's a whole lot of fun, but the movie's terrible. And then other times you work on something and it's like a terrible experience, but the product is good. And this one was a lot of fun to do the pilot. Um, you know, I didn't have too much trauma, a little bit of trauma, maybe when um, Mr. Imperioli uh, backed the car into a train. But, um, <laughs> you had trauma. I, mean, I had trauma. Believe me, it was a horrible moment. The last um, thing you want to do as an actor is smash cars. I mean, with the star of the show, who I don't really know next to me. Yeah, I mean, luck, luckily we had a backup car, and I don't. Nobody got hurt, and everybody was good. And it's a great story all these years later. It but, is. Um, yeah, it was worth it for uh, the story. It was. It was. It, it was worth it. But there was a point where um, I don't know. I showed the pilot to, I guess, yeah. You know, the whole point before I took the job, I was like, I'm done with television. I'm done with movies. I'm. I want to move to London. I mean, this is like. You know, before 19, so 1997, so it's before 1997. I'm just going to you know, go off. And so when they called me t- for the interview, I actually was about to go to London because like I'm moving to London. I, I don't know why. It was just at the time. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and so once I got the job, I, I didn't move to London. But after we were done shooting the pilot, I had some time because I couldn't take another job while we waited to see if it was picked up. And I remember getting a copy and showing it to my friends in London. And they really liked it. And then I showed it to, you know, somebody, a couple of friends in the States, and they really liked it. But then you're thinking like, oh, I don't know, maybe people are being polite. But I'm sure David's told the story where right before um, right before the show was about to go on the air, HBO called us up and all of a sudden wanted to throw us like a little bit of a premiere party. You remember this party, Michael, right? Yeah. At John's, at at John's, John's Pizza. Pizza. I have yeah, the so- uh, I have the invitation still. Really? Yeah. Wow. I also have my script from my audition with my notes on I mean, the character was still Dean Moltisante and Tony was right. Tommy, Soprano. Tommy Soprano with my little notes on what to do in the audition. I still have that. Wow. I have the, I have a pilot script. I have a pilot script. I definitely have the last script too. I've dug up a couple of things when people have asked me for uh, interview stuff. I've, I've dug up some pages. Um but yeah, I have a, a basement full of, I, every time I go to clean out the basement, I'm like, well, I should probably keep some of this stuff. 
So they wanted to throw the the premier party somehow tipped you off that they were into it. Is well, that it? Yeah, they were kind of. They called us up. And they said, "Yeah, we're going to do the screen." It was like that Virgin movie theater that was in. It was like under the Virgin Record Store in Times Square. And yeah, they did that party at John's Pizza, and I remember you know uh, Springsteen and the band came, and they were kind of upstairs there, and. Um, yeah, it's sort of all of a sudden they seem to be kind of excited about it. So it felt like they must have shown it to some people um, and they liked it. And all of a sudden there was something was happening. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't know, know from the pilot. Yeah, you know, I read the pilot. I liked it. I can't say I was like I had no way of gauging how good it was. I really I liked it, but I wasn't sure where it was going to go. You know, yeah, it really was yeah. not till we started. And after shooting the pilot, still, I didn't know. And, and when I saw it, you know, anything that I'm in immediately, I, it, I think it's terrible anyway. So I, I get all in my head. It really wasn't until the first season reading this, the script after script, that first season when we were shooting. Then I was like, whoa, what? This is way beyond yeah, I mean, anything I predicted. Definitely when I was at the very beginning where I really, there weren't, you know, on the pilot, because there weren't any other writers or producers, there was really just David and myself. And when I'd get in the car with him in the van and would drive around places in New Jersey, you know, you, you know, when you, when you do a film, right, you only need one good script. Okay. So, so you're doing right. a movie, you read a good movie script, you're making the movie. The thing about when you read pilots is, is like, you, you can say, wow, that's a really good pilot. But it's only a really good pilot if you think, am I going to be interested in these characters season five, episode four? You know? Yeah, that's the and thing about and an actor, too. I had never done a series except like a couple of guest spots. So yeah. I had only done mostly – I made my living doing independent film like in the 90s for a lot of it. So mm -hmm. I'm used to reading a script. Do I want to do it or not? And that's it, even if it's a guest spot. This is you read one script, then you're committing to maybe a 100 of them. You know. Yeah. And, and so the interesting thing was, is that I knew that there was something cool when we were in the casting process, because, you know, when you started to come together, like, um, you know, for instance, like Michael Rispoli came in for Tony Soprano, as did, you know, Jimmy Gandolfini. Michael Rispoli was excellent, too. I mean, he was he was top notch, which is why he got cast later on, um, you know. But but when Jimmy came in there and then I mean. Jimmy was a, like an amazing moment, but the really amazing moment was Nancy Marchand, yeah. you know, um, when she came in because, you know, we had had sort of all the actresses who you would think were sort of the typical Italian grandmothers walk sure. in. And then when Nancy Marchand came in, it was like, I mean, David's pale to start with, but like when Nancy did her, did her audition, literally the color drained from David's face as if he had just seen his mother. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it was pretty crazy. And yeah. so once there was that, I mean, you know, look, Goodfellas was one of my favorite films. So, you know, um, and I had seen uh, the funny thing about Goodfellas is I had been working on a terrible movie that Peter Bogdanovich was actually directing um, when I uh, when um, Goodfellas came out. And one of my friends took me to the cast and crew screening of Goodfellas. So I'd I was at it that one. It was in the theaters, really. So it was the cast and crew screening of Goodfellas. And I walked out and I was like, I was walking, working in this bad film and I was like, I can't even go to work tomorrow. Like I just saw the greatest movie. I can't go to work tomorrow on my bad film. Um, so I was like, you know, knew all you guys from, from being a fan of Goodfellas. So like when you walked in the door, you know, um, or, you know, when Dominic walked in the door, you know, of course, you know, him from Godfather, um, you know, Sirico, I mean, all this, you know, obviously Lorraine, um, you know, all these people walked in. It was kind of like, oh, yeah, like it's all sort of coming together and, and watching the wheels, watching the wheels in David's head, um, figuring out like, OK, so if I have Dominic, I have Sirico, like just figuring out who is sort of playing, you know, which thing is sort of putting it together. Um, you know, and then like Edie was one of the last ones cast and I, you know, sort of through friends of friends, I sort of knew Edie and I thought, oh, I don't know, is this going to work? I mean, she's kind of younger than I am. Is she, is she old enough to do this? And then she came in and like, you know, hit the ball out of the park and, you know, that was great. I was like, okay, we got it. You know, mm. um, but you, you, did, know, you I, did a home, you did a home run audition. Like that was, you know, that, that was like one of the pieces, one of the main pieces coming together. Yeah. That was a, uh, that was a, an interesting experience because David doesn't give anything away. In the oh, room. poker face. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. I mean, you, you had a deal with, 
with all these personalities, every moment, I would think your job is every moment is fucking terrible. Almost every moment, your phone rings, texts, emails, because you're dealing with scheduling. This actor did this. This guy showed up. I mean, it's a million things, even when everyone gets along. It's got to be a pain in the ass. Your job to me is a pain in the ass job. It, it is. It is. In the one hand, it is a pain in the ass. In the other hand, it's like, you know, when, when you have really talented people, um, you know, who are nice people, too. You know what I mean? We had a really great bunch of people. Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, but there's still personalities. Things happen. Yeah. And nobody, you know, none of us were perfect. Guys, uh, you know, you know what, what we know what went yeah, on and you've yeah. got to deal with all that, you know. That's you know, that's when you tell that's that's when you call up Angela Tarantino to come uh, on location with you so she can get the videotape out from the hotel, you know. Like that's <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Like that's that's in the planning, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's put it this way. I think that um Thank goodness it was pre, you know, pre uh, iPhone, you know, pre like the video, the internet age that we live in now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if somebody did something that somebody got on camera, it meant that they had to like take their little camera. They had to go home. They had to upload it to their computer. Like there's a bit of a lag time to this. I mean, that would have been horrible. Yeah, it would have been horrible. I mean, there's a certain amount of paranoia we had about the scripts and the plots not getting out and all of that. But can you imagine, you know, think back to all our days. It's like if everybody had a cell phone on set that, the, that you know, if every all the people watching from the sidelines or if every extra had a had an iPhone. Can you oh, like, God, even yeah. imagine what our lives would have been? So I feel like there was a certain amount of um, I, I, I would love to return to that kind of innocence in a certain way. Um, Steve, sure. Steve wants to go back to the sixties. Well, before still got a flip phone. <laughs> before cell phone, I do too. I, I don't want to walk away to get it, but I still have a flip phone. Yes, I do too. Steve um, would go back to the telegraph if if he could yeah. go all the way. Back. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> simpler, better times. Simpler, better times. Yeah, in this, yeah. In this no, lunacy it, that we're dealing with. Lunacy. Yeah. No, so someone is easier. But you know what? I always I always say about, um, you know, the job that I have, it's it's like sort of a little bonus that I kind of know how movies and television shows are made. They, they sort of hire me to be the staff psychologist. You know, that's sort of more of the job. Absolutely. <laughs> it certainly is. And what is your favorite episode? Do you have one favorite? Do I have one favorite? I mean, I have to say, like, uh Season four, number 13, um, that John Patterson directed when, um, White Caps. That Whitecaps? That's is that my favorite. Yeah. 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 That Whitecaps would probably be, right. you know, and, and, and when we did it, like, um, you know, when we'd get to the end of, you know, it was always a big deal, right? When, when the last, when the last episode played of a season, you know, in terms of like people watching it in the press and what everybody thought the next day and all of that, you know, a lot of the audience really, didn't like that episode because it made them super uncomfortable, Yeah, you know, because we broke up the marriage, you know? So yeah. the audience was like, Hey, they were always much more comfortable when, you know, somebody, somebody got whacked and all was well with the world. You <laughs> Which know? is very but, weird, isn't it? That's yeah, it is really weird. Just to, just to think about that. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so that we broke up the marriage, I think it made people, it wasn't a cathartic moment for them. It made people really uncomfortable. And I think it probably hit a little too close to home. Tool for a yeah. lot of people because yeah, yeah, it was like yeah. it was like you know peeping in on somebody's you know bedroom conversation it was very intimate and very raw and honest um, yeah the I acting mean, and that and the writing was uh, oh, off the charts so two of them off jim the and charts. Edie, jesus and the other one that i would have to say because i just because i knew i was coming on here i was like i don't know let me pick some things to watch and i just watched um long-term parking and uh uh all due respect. And yeah. like long term parking is uh that's the one where, where Drea gets gets whacked. Oh, and that's a really I mean, good one. It's a really good one. And you and Drea were like fantastic. I mean mm, that's so good. You know, and 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 and, and uh C V, you know, when Silvio takes her for the ride and I everything. Know. And yeah, I that's know. a I, I forgot how good that episode was. Yeah. I mean 
I have to say watching an episode last night and watching an episode this morning made me really want to just go back and sit down and, you know, blow off work for a couple for a couple weeks here and just uh, watch all 86 again. It's been amazing because oh, we did. Steve and I hadn't watched it since the initial airing, really. Um, so going back and really having to watch with a lot of attention and pay attention to detail and stuff, it's been very re- rewarding, really seeing, you know, with some distance and with kind of hindsight of other shows that have been on the air and looking back, just seeing how, how great it is. It's and and the performances, the performances yeah. were so, you know, uh, Stevie Van Zandt was so much, not that I ever thought he was bad, but he was so much better. Sylvia was such a great character. So great. And I appreciate that. And, and almost, I, I can't see anyone doing the roles except for the people that did the roles. Honestly, yeah, the, other, I, I, the cast rate yeah. was impeccable, you know. Yeah, I, I would say, and you know who also is so interesting to watch over the course is, is Robert Eiler. Like, yeah. oh, you yeah. know, it, from, you know, where he started out. I mean, he got, you know, he got the job on the line, you know, what, no fucking ZD. And then, you know, you get him in those later episodes and like, he's great. Um, and he grew up on the show. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is very, it's, it's really it's a lot of, uh, I'm getting a lot of pleasure out of rewatching it. I really, and I'm, you know, I wasn't sure what it was going to be like. Uh, am I going to have enough to talk about, about the shows? But it's like, it goes deep. There's a lot to talk about all the time on every episode. Uh, it's. Oh yeah. It's so know. funny. And uh, you know, all the things we knew and, and you know, the things, you know, prompt your memory of what we were doing that day and the conversation and, you know, and all everything that goes with it. You know, we've watched it yeah. twice now because of the book wow. too. So, you know. Speaking of memory, do you have yes. one memory or moment that really crystallizes what it was like to be part of the show? Oh wow! Um, I mean, there's there's funny things sort of outside of the set, um, and I don't know, Steve, were you there? I know, I know, Michael, you were there when we went. I remember because it was Vinny Pastore. We went to a boxing match at Madison Square Garden. Oh yeah, that yeah. was yeah. Felix Trinidad and Oscar De La Hoya, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was pretty early on, and we walked into the garden, you know, from the the sort of backstage bottom area there, and the crowd was going wild for the cast of The Sopranos. Yeah, and I yeah, was like, yeah. oh, this is. This is pretty because, you don't, you know, you watch just because you're watching when you work on a show, you watch a show, your friends watch the show, sort of people, you know, watch the show. But you don't really realize that it's sort of like seeped into, you know, the culture, you know, um, and that was that was one of the big that was one of the moments we all kind of went. Wow. Yeah, I know. Well, I remember amazing. when we uh, the finale, when we were all in Florida and oh, you yeah. were with us, that, that was, was crazy. crazy. That, that, was, that crazy was crazy down at the Hard Rock. That was, yeah. Yeah. That was crazy because I, that was so crazy because I remember there was like 600 people in that tent. And when the screen cut to black, they all just thought that the thing went out because it was a tape. And yeah, but, but remember going, uh, it was 10,000 people walking through the casino yeah, on red the carpet. red carpet. Yeah. And then we were in Connecticut the night before at Foxwoods, yeah. remember? Yeah. And we took yeah, the private I plane the down Woods. there. Yeah, I, I remember so many of those, like the casino things always blew my mind, like that there were so many people. That that was always and kind of amazing to me. That you like, probably remember better than us, because me and Michael <laughs> were yeah, probably, I, I, we were probably, you know, yeah. uh, what, what, I, what I will say, about, what I will say about those, those times is that um, because those were not official Sopranos events, I can't say that I was on the best behavior. Let's put it that way. Yeah. When, when, when I was on some of the, when we were at the Plaza at Nay, although I do remember, I will admit to this one, I guess it was when we won the Emmy, maybe the last to the second time when we won the Emmy and we all ended up in like Jamie Lynn Siegler's little yeah. room and we ordered everything on the room service menu. And I just remember it was so crowded that like people, we only let the people up from the show. Like you couldn't, it wasn't outsiders, although there was a famous outsider who knocked on the door, but um, yeah. And I think we had Marchetti on the door and um, we ordered everything on the room service menu and everybody just sort of, you know, hung out late, late night. 
And it was. And it was, you would pick like a, up those tabs for us. You, you at the Peninsula <laughs> Hotel. <Yeah. laughs> that that would, would not be me. That would, that would be HBO. <laughs> yes. But I mean, but but you gave the okay. I mean, these were giant. Yeah. More tabs. The, giant yes, thousands and that, thousands. That would be the good old days. Um, you can thank the likes of like Arthur Badavis and Cindy Tenor and uh, Marav and and uh, you know those yeah. guys. That that was the. Uh, that was the old time. I think we have to uh, sort of advocate that for whatever job we do next with HBO, uh, that uh, the new that the new bosses uh, keep the party going. Uh, Other networks is BYOB, you know, in those. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, this was thousands and thousands of dollars. But, you know, a lot of people uh, have asked, you know, on the final uh, CD box, Right uh, of yeah. uh, a DVD box, uh, yeah. the famous Vanity Fair picture. They want yeah. everyone wants to know who is that girl. And in so the for the people yeah. out there, <laughs> this is that girl in the middle. Oh, Eileen Landris is that girl. <laughs> right, because you got you know the whole crew, and you got I mean the whole cast. Uh, where Jim famously fell asleep. On the floor, remember between uh, 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 photos. Remember Jim. Jim was yep. flat out sleeping in his bathroom, and he looks yep. that way. Uh, but it's Dominic and David and the and the cast, and right in the middle, everyone. It's me. This is her. There's a famous thing about that photo is that everybody, um, all all the actors, right, were in their their costumes. And then Annie uh, Leibowitz, the photographer, sent everybody back and said, "Okay, you can get in your street clothes that you came here with." Except Jimmy stayed in his bathrobe. And so yeah. then they popped. They popped like I popped in. I think some of the hair and makeup people popped in, and and so it was just kind of this great thing because everybody was like half themselves and half their characters because mm. yeah, you know, they sort of were in hair and makeup, but they oh, were in yeah. their own street clothes. That's and that's funny. when we all popped in. Yeah, I love that photo. I actually, it's in. It's in my house here um, in the next room. The other thing that's sitting here in my house that I'm actually looking at is, um, you know, the pork store, right? The, the pork store was um, an auto body place that was being renovated. And we stopped them from renovating it and we took it over and made it into the pork store. But we had our scenic artists paint right on the walls. Um, and so they painted the, all the little piglets, you know, on the cappuccino yeah. side. There's all the little piglets. So when when we finished the show, um, that place was going to be torn down because it was sold. It's condos now or something. Apartments or condos. It's a parking lot. So a parking lot now. Yeah. So so they took um, we we had the the uh, carpenters just take out the wood walls that it were painted, and we sort of chopped it up. So David has one. I have one. I think Henry has one, and Gary Grill, the uh, head of construction. And we have like panels. So I have like a, a panel of like three little piglets. Oh, wow. Um, wow. That's a great a souvenir. Show. Yeah. It's a, it's great. it's like my best souvenir. So Very cool. That, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, um, Eileen, I could not have thanked you enough for doing this. Seriously. Uh, it was great to see you. I haven't seen you in so many years. Yeah. And thank you so I, much. And it was a great conversation and wonderful information. And I'm sure the fans are going to love it. Thank you. Thanks. So great to see you guys. Steve, you look like you're like aging backwards. You look younger. You look young. <laughs> uh, I'm doing okay. I don't dye my hair. Everything's all right. I'm doing okay. I'm hanging in. I made a comeback. I was on the ropes for a while. I made a comeback. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Um, thank you, Thank you very much. I hope it wasn't like too disjointed or whatever. Fantastic. Not in the least bit. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. We'll see you. We'll Thanks see you for coming we'll see on. You. Take care. Okay. Right. That was fantastic. I mean, Landris. She knows where the bodies she, are buried. She was also right. kind of like the Ray Donovan of the Soprano production crew in a way. She, <laughs> she had to make, you know, she had to. She, had a, she was kind of like the fixer done. as well. Yes. She had to get She did done. an amazing job. Uh, the show, you know, is a test, testament to her and hard she work has as well. a hell of a career. Yeah. She's one of the top TV producers in the world. Yeah. Seriously. All right, man, let's take a break and let's get into this crazy episode. Got another All great right. guest, man. I never met this guy and I've looked forward to it. And I'm, I'm glad we're going to get to speak to him today. Yeah, this is an extremely talented director and producer, has directed episodes for 87 different television series. Wow. 
Miami Vice, including Miami Vice, Northern Exposure, Beverly Hills 90210, The Wire, Six Feet Under, True Blood, Entourage, Deadwood, Lost, the feature film Silver Bullet. He was nominated for two Emmys for his directing on Entourage. Recently released his new book, uh, Directing Great Television, Inside TV's New Golden Age. There's probably not many people more qualified to write a book like this because obviously his credits really illustrate uh, his work on exactly that, the new golden age of television. Do you, do you, do you think I should ask him if Don Johnson's a real prick? You can. I'm sure I'm he, he may. He may not. All right. Uh, he directed three episodes of The Sopranos, including the first episode not directed by David Chase, which was episode two, season one, 46 long. Please welcome Mr. Dan Adius. Hey, guys. Thank hey, you Dan. So much. How are you, hey. man? Good to see you, Steve. Good to finally meet you. You know, you weren't, unfortunately for me, in any of the three episodes I directed, but I did actually meet you once. We were filming in New Jersey or something. We finished the day and they were doing a pickup for another episode. I remember you were by, I guess it was Junior's car or something. That's what you drove, right? Oh, yeah, and it was yeah, like yeah. you met with uh, with Jim and uh, my day was done. But I, I, you uh, know. I might have been <laughs> drunk then. You never know. You never know. But my, uh, my, mind, my mind is a blur. I barely yeah, yeah. remember Michael's name. I, you know, I can't remember yesterday, but I remember stuff like that. So there you go. <laughs> well, that, thanks for joining us. We really yeah, appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Uh, so then you're not a New York guy. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in L.A. And I'm in New York now because I'm going to be doing billions uh, in a little short while. But uh, and my granddaughter, my daughter lives here, my two granddaughters. So but I'm, I'm out of L.A. So you knew, did you know growing up that you were going to get into the, you know, not hometown a, business? Not, a, not no? a whiff, not a hint. It wasn't until I was in like my mid twenties. I didn't know what the fuck I wanted to do. I gotten into law schools, realized that wasn't it for me. Then I started acting for about three years, which was like, I never got out of, uh, I mean, I just, you know, took classes and was in some plays and stuff just to kind of free myself up. I thought I'd love to do it, but you know, as an actor, I just couldn't really get out of my own way. I was too self-conscious. I kind of, I understood what scenes, you know, required where I should be emotionally, but I just got in my own way. And then it was odd. I was in, I was at UCLA uh, in the film school just so I could take, it was odd, so I could take acting classes and I had to make a short film and I made this little Super 8 thing and I put it together and that was like the epiphany. I realized that it was much better for me if I could work with actors who had this kind of more open channel and I could communicate and not feel so personally being scrutinized in the moment. And uh, the acting really was the best training I ever had as a director because I really understood from the inside, you know, what it makes sense to hear if you're trying to, you know, get into a different mentality and dealing with, you know, talented people like yourselves who aren't, aren't so con constricted inside it was really uh i get tremendous pleasure helping helping an actor find a performance that's a really big skill for a director because um not a lot of directors honestly most directors don't have that skill yeah yeah you have it you cultivated it by understanding it from the actor's point of view i don't mind if a director doesn't have it and they don't pretend and they just kind of leave you you know and 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 let you kind of find it. And that's okay. I'd rather someone communicate. The worst is when someone thinks they know how to communicate and they don't. That's when it gets really not fun. Well, what, I, what, I, what I've learned uh, is just to respect every individual you're working with as an actor. You know, it's one of the things I wrote a chapter about in, the, in this book, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but you really... You know, it's interesting because in an episodic television, you're coming on and you're the temporary guy, you know, it's right. like, and you're, you have to kind of develop command right away and respect, trust. And uh, that's a whole skill. And I think the main thing I've learned is that uh, you have to come in with humility, but you also have to come in with uh, holding the vision of what wants to be communicated. And then right. you have to develop a relationship with each person. It's like, so I have to read, you know, who you are as an actor, who you are as a person, because I, you know, and. Sometimes you just got to stay out of the way. You got to let an actor find it themselves. Sometimes you got to help them with imaginary circumstances. Sometimes you got to plant, root them in the story, where they are in the story. 
But it's all about really, to me, uh, you know, respecting that it has to come from within that actor. So you have to intuit, you know, what, who that human being is you're relating to and develop trust, get trust from them. Because like you say, if you think they're full of shit, you know, uh, that makes your job tougher, not to mention it makes their job a lot tougher. No. Now, Dan, uh, of all the, you, you've got 87 different titles. You've directed a ton of shit. You've worked with big, big stars. Do you still get intimidated oh, by actors I, <laughs> or coming on a stage? You know, it's so funny, Stephen. It's like I, another thing I think about directing is like, I've got to be audience. I've got to be part audience myself. That's part of what I'm doing when I'm directing. It's like I, you kind of have two two modes of perception. It's like you know the story, but you have to also think, if I'm the audience, what do I know at this point? <laughs> you know, so you got to, you got to, you know, and it's similar because I love stories being told to me. I love, I think that's what we all are doing when we're watching shows. We, we want to see a story. And, and so I am just like any of us, you know, I create fantasies about, I build up people and yeah, I can be very intimidated by, oh my God, I'm going to work with, you know, X in the next show. And it's interesting because during my prep, I'm trying to kind of maybe say hello until I kind of, then invariably you see the truth, which is everybody is just a person. They put on their pants one leg at a time. Yeah. They're not, they're not this persona that they may have projected all around. And it's like, but it does take a little, and I'm glad for that because I want to be affected by story. I want to be affected by what an actor does. So yeah, there is, so, and actors are all different. So, you know, I mean, the one thing that was struck me right away on The Sopranos, and I, it was a big lesson for me too, is, and I, I wonder what you guys think about this, but in my experience, everything flows from number one on the call sheet. And Gandolfini was such a mensch and wouldn't brook any bullshit from anybody. He didn't brook it from himself. You know, I know he had his demons and would come out at times, but he was the hardest worker I've ever seen and, and was harder on himself than on anybody. And uh, so no one could, you know, I would think, you know, two, three, four down the call sheet, you know, it's hard to, you know, start getting full of yourself and, and uh, you know, not being a team player when number one is, is you know, the quintessence of that. So Yeah, that definitely had a big effect on the show. And it was a constant yeah. and a consistent element throughout. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Um, you went, you were an AD at one point. Is that true? You yeah, you know, Bilber? I went to, yeah, I went to, uh, well, as I said, I started out thinking I want to be an actor. For so three years, I kidded myself that I was why well, you? Fine. Why did you make the right move? <laughs> <laughs> so, I wound up going to film school and I got an MFA program directing. But I didn't have a thesis film I wanted to make, and I didn't want to be a career film student, big fish in a small pond. So I thought, well, what can I do until I have a film I want to make? And I thought, well, I could if I could assist great directors, I could learn. And I didn't know at that time. Assistant director, you guys know what assistant director does. It's like, so, you know, I was up at 4 a.m. to do the first makeup call and all that. So I got into this thing, the uh, DGA assistant director's training program. And I worked for two years as a trainee and then two years as a second AD. And in those four years, I was very fortunate. I worked as a trainee. I worked on Airplane, the movie Airplane. And as a second AD, I worked on ET, the extraterrestrial. Wow. wow. Second. And uh, there was one other... Oh, yeah, Coppola. I worked for Coppola on One from the Heart, which was a Great story movie. to a podcast in itself on that. Is, is, that, that, is that the one with Burt Young? No. John Boyd? John no. Boyd? No. 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 It's I Frederick with, Forrest, I with, right? I worked with Voight, though, on uh, Ray Donovan, but no. Frederick uh, Forrest was in that. Was Freddie he? Forrest, Nastasia Kinski, uh, Lenny Kazan, Tom Harry Waits. Dean, Tom Waits was, did oh. the music, and he was hanging around. Harry Dean Stanton and uh, Lenny, what did I say? Lenny and Nastasia. Oh, Raul Julia was the other. There were like six leads in that. So I was uh, second AD on that. So I, you know, I had some great, exp I also did a, was second AD on Twilight Zone, the movie. Thankfully, not in the episode Landis did where people died. But uh, for, for Joe Dante and, and Spielberg again and George Miller. So, wow. uh, yeah. So after I finished the days as a second, I knew I didn't want to be a first. I knew I wanted to direct. So I didn't make the transition to first. I went back to film school, made a, made, finally had a script I wanted to do, made a film, 
and came out and I presented myself as a director wanting to direct, not like, you know, we all know. It's like, well, I'm a boom man, but I really want to direct. Will you have faith in me and hire me? I want to say, not I'm not an assistant director, but I'm a director. I'm out of film school. I have this film. Will you hire me? And that, that worked. So, wow. And I think you have to do that. I think even as an actor, you know, like you, you see people, they're trying to break in and they're, you know, their background, their extras. And unfortunately, a lot of times they see you as an extra forever. Yeah. Right? And they'll never give you a line. Right. You know, at some point you got to go, no, I'm an actor. Right. Yeah, I did that, but I'm an actor. That's it. That's what I do. Yeah. Uh, isn't it true, Stephen? It's like, if you don't believe in yourself, how can you expect in someone else to, you know, take a chance and believe in you? Absolutely. You but, it, right? yeah. but, but, you know, working with those guys and working on those huge jobs, E.T., huge movie, uh, in the yeah. Twilight Zone. and uh, Second A.D. is a very difficult job. <laughs> it's a thankless fucking job. Yeah. You get shit on by the first A.D. Yeah. and by everybody else above you. Yeah, and you have the worst times. You're, you're there for the first makeup call. You're doing uh, a fucking call yeah. sheet at the end of the day. Tough gig. Production Tough reports. Gig. Yeah, yeah. But it was great because, I mean, I'll tell you to finish the story. So what happened is so I make this film, and it wins a bunch of film festivals. And, uh, and, uh, I get a pro Dino, uh, I got an agent out of it and he was known at the time for finding good young directors. So Dino, Dino De Laurentiis was making a Stephen King horror film and he called up my agent and said, who do you have young and cheap? And, uh, he said, I'll send you Dan. So I met Dino and I met Frank Mancuso who was head of Paramount at the time. It was my first job. It was a feature called Silver Bullet and Stephen King Silver Bullet. And, uh, what was great is I could say, yeah, but can they get, can you handle yourself on a set? And I say, well, I've also done all these features as, a, as an AD. Yeah. So I learned, you know, all about the process, all about what the jobs are, what the trade-offs are. So that was probably as responsible as anything else in me getting hired. So. And who starred in the movie that you directed? Silver Bullet. Yeah. It was Gary Busey and it was Corey Haim. He uh -huh. played this kid in a wheelchair and Megan, uh, Megan Follows, who was a wonderful, is a wonderful actress from Canada. This is 1984, 85. Was you know? that before uh, Gary Busey went off to the It was an interesting time for Busey because he, he had done, he had done Buddy Holly story. And he I got just, nominated. I, loved, nominated. I just thought he was amazing. Right. And, and in this part, it called for this uncle that everybody loves. Who's an alcoholic, who's, Bitter but charming, and I just thought I gotta have. Kind of sounds like I would have been right. For <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, <laughs> yeah, I'd only known you then, and uh, and I. And, but Busey was having substance. Imagine this: Busey was having substance abuse problems, and he hadn't been working. And here I am, hired by Dino, and it's my first picture. And I say, uh, I really want this guy. <laughs> so they said it's your funeral, and you know, so I got him, and he was just great. But he was like, and he was bloated because he was not taking drugs. And he was eating a lot. And he was a handful. He was more work than any of the kids. It was a kid's picture. They were like 12, 13 years old. And, uh, but it was a magical performance. I just thought it was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so what was the first television job you had? My first TV job was uh, in 1985, I think. They, uh, they were making a series out of a feature film, uh, Fast Time or Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, it only lasted six episodes. So I did right. one of those. But the right. next one was Miami Vice. Mm. And Vice in 86 was like the third season. And uh, <laughs> it was so bizarre because it's like Vice said, we only hire feature directors. You know, and it was a smash by then. It was a smash. Yeah, yeah. Huh. And they also had this idea that they're, they're, no, they're not TV, they're features, you know. Right. And we only hire feature directors. So me, who knew this much about filmmaking, you know, I knew nothing because I just done one, you know, thing. But I get hired to do it, and uh, it was fascinating. I really got hit upside the head. I got through it, but it was it was a great. It's funny. I have a chapter. My my first chapter, second chapter is School of Hard Knocks. I write about how how I got hit upside the head, and what I learned from. It. So, and you ask about Don Johnson. He was a force. He was a terror. He was like they called him the King of Miami, right? And uh, I came in and, and, you know, I was just trying to learn film language because it's a language. It's like, you know, where, how you position the camera, screen direction, all that stuff. And I was kind of terrified about, am I going to, am I going to know how to cover it? Am I going to know all that stuff? So I'd, I'd work hard at trying to figure out, 
a shot plan and I'd show up and Don Johnson would just say, yeah, no, let's not do that. Let's do this. And he'd take, he'd take over and he'd, he'd get together all these, all these different ideas and he'd get with the cameraman. And the thing is, he was right. They were better ideas. So it's like, I, you know, I went with him, but I felt, you know, emasculated and got down in front of the crew and all that. I didn't really have any problems with Don. He was he was just a force. He was very. But a lot, you know, uh, Dan. A lot of TV shows, the lead calls the shots. Yeah, right. That's very common. If they're a star and it's a hit, sure. Well, yeah. but Stephen, I've now done two hundred and forty episodes. I would never let that happen again, gotcha. and I never had. Gotcha. But but it's true, you know. But it, I think a lot of the reason is, it's like you know, act. It's like. Actors, you guys are the permanent ones. The director comes in. So you got to demonstrate that you're taking responsibility and you know something about what you're doing. If you can do that, then I think a lot of that anxiety of the cast, I, it, sure, there are some assholes. There's some megalomaniacs. And, all of that. Course. Those, and that's that remains to this day. Fortunately, I, I think I've avoided them pretty much. But, you know, I, I know I've neutralized that energy a lot when I come in and I've I know I know as much I know more about the story of this particular episode than they do, and I can prove that. I have an idea and a plan, and I have interesting subtext to suggest and interesting conflicts to kind of talk about. And then people tend to okay, relax because believe me, I have tremendous sympathy, empathy for what actors go through. It's your guys' mugs up there, and it's like if somebody comes in and they don't trust you, you know, I don't I don't have time to take care of you. I'm just going to take care of myself and make sure it's right. Yeah. So. That's an issue. And now, how did you get, uh, how did you connect with the Sopranos and David Chase? Yeah, that was, uh, that's, that's a great story. Up to me, it is, because it's important to me. I had done Northern Exposure. I had, I had been directing for quite a while, you know, easily 10 years, 10, 15 years before. I, 1998 was, I think, that first year. But in 97, I, I hadn't met David until I did, uh, I did about five episodes of Northern Exposure. And in the last year of Northern, David had taken it over as the showrunner, and uh, and I did the epi- I did an episode, and it went well. And I thought it was the end of my tenure there because it was we knew it was going to be canceled because Rob Morrow had left the show. CBS was dumping it onto a night nobody would watch, and I left. And I got a call uh, saying asking if I could fly right back and do another episode because the director had quit. And <laughs> I said, okay, and I found out. I said, well, Kent, let me read the script first uh, if it's so bad. And uh, I read it and immediately saw its potential and that I understood how the director and, and some of the cast were rebelling about it because it seemed like they were jumping the shark. Everybody was having to do things that did, were crazy. Well, was this the one where they found the Italian deli in the, in the uh, woods? No, no. But, you know, oh. you ask about Northern. <laughs> I think Northern is like, to me, Sopranos kicked off the golden age of television, but if any if any previous show deserved to be considered in that, I think it was Northern Exposure. I think it was a great show. And that's with, uh, with Paul Provenza at the end. Uh, yeah, right. It's right. a comedian, Paul Provenza. And, t- and Terry Polo, who was like his wife. So anyway, I come up, I fly up, I, I love the script, and I just think people just don't understand what the story is. And I got up there, and David was there in the meetings, and the, and Robin, it's your writers who were on The Sopranos, Mitch Green and Robin, um, Robin Green and Mitch Burgess had written that. And uh, it turned out to be a great episode. And David was very appreciative and very gracious about it. And uh, that's when I got to know him. And after he did the pilot of Sopranos, he called me up and asked if I'd do the first episode. And uh, and it was several months. It, Michael, I'm sure you recall, it was like, I don't know how many months. It was like six or eight months after you guys did the pilot. Oh, almost a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And David and I went out to lunch. And I saw it and I was just like, oh, my God, you know. I didn't know it would be a hit, huge hit. I knew, I thought it was unlike anything I'd ever seen and I loved it. And uh, so I got hired, but it was really funny because I had dec- I had taken my first job, which I don't do often to this day because I don't really love getting tied up as a producer director, but I had just signed a two-year contract on Party of Five to be a producer director. And I didn't think I was going to be able to squeeze it in, but I asked for like a week or two off before I started and they gave it to me and I came to New York and we did episode two, 46 long. And it was so bittersweet because I thought I'm in, here I am in Nirvana and I can't come back for two years. I'm going, you know, and, uh, but it was, uh, it was fantastic. And David was fantastic. And you guys were fantastic. Did so. dad, uh, tell me the truth now. Did, did Michael give you a fucking attitude? 
Michael is great, and I because he's he got a he's had a big fucking ego, giant <laughs> ego since you dealt with him last. You know, fucking yeah. giant. Well, I, I gotta say, I, I, we'll talk about the first episode, but I was really <laughs> glad I got to do Telltale Musadel, which Michael wrote, and it was a great script. And uh, I heard last week you said that was your second script. I thought it was your first script, but that was, I guess, the second one that got made. But the first one, yeah, my, it was a great episode for Michael because it was like oh. he was with Brendan. Who, who's the actor who played Brendan? I forget. His Anthony name. DeSando. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the hijack of this. Yeah. Of the suits and truck. there were so many great scenes in yeah. that with you and, and uh, seeing seeing Scorsese come in. And, Kundun, I liked it. That right. Was, oh, that was that episode. And uh, uh, But I remember one little moment with you, Michael. It was uh, <laughs> when you decide not to go with, uh, with Brendan to, to jack the second truck. All right. And you're kind of in your... Yeah, you're high on grass and you're lounging back and Brendan's oh. hot. He says, come on, relate, relate. He said, no, no, no. What's the point of being in a gang? And he got very philosophical. It was very funny. I remember between takes, I was laughing with you about it. He said, yeah, I forget exactly your words, but it was something like, yeah, a gangster reflects. Something like right. that. <laughs> you know, that, was, that was a great moment. Do you know when I read that script, right? So I guess we get picked up. Uh, right before Christmas of 97, we know yeah. we're coming back. I probably didn't read that script till right before we shot it, which was yeah. early summer. Yeah. And I was convinced they were bringing Brendan on to replace me. Oh, as like man. the young mob guy, protege of Tony Soprano. Because I was like, they obviously need this guy because they're getting rid of me. Because I'm, You know, like, you guys, I'm sure everybody, every sensitive human being in our jobs has the same as the directors feel too. But that's another reason I'm glad I'm not an actor because you guys really face that. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. That's, that's yeah. exactly right. how I felt. Um, right. right. Tell us about the book. Do you, uh, t- tell us about why you did it and, and what it's about. And oh, yeah. let the fans know because I'm sure a lot of them are going to be interested. Oh, in thanks. Well, it. you know, about six, eight years ago, I started mentoring. You know, a lot of directors from time to time, young directors asked to shadow me, and I like to, you know, do that. And, uh, you know, some, some impress me, some don't. And I got to a point about, I guess, eight years ago where this third, a third person came along who just struck me as just right. Someone who's like, had been they're just just shy like 30 years old they made a good film they'd been trying staying at it for several years i knew they had commitment i liked them and i thought you know i'm gonna start a little mentoring group and try to show the you know address kind of gap learning like when you really have to direct you know there's one thing in film school but okay now you're on a set what are you going to do when you show up so we would i would do things like not just I'd take them to acting workshops and I'd direct and then I'd turn them over and we'd critique it. We'd talk to the actors. We'd do, we did different things. And I just had to, what was great is I just started deconstructing my problem. What do I do when I direct? Because it's instinctive. But I thought, I, I started to say, well, I'll write a book. And, and that was the first impulse. But as I started to do it, I didn't want it to be a how-to book. And I wanted to illustrate points by sharing my experience and trying to say, okay, well, this is the situation. And this was the problem and this was a failed effort. And then this is what worked. And I started breaking things down like that. And I wound up telling stories about my experience on shows that I know people would really be interested in. And uh, it was a little funny and frustrating because I, I only want, I only to- told stories where they could illustrate a point. So some of like more high profile episodes I've done, I didn't mention or couldn't talk about because I didn't want to just be bragging, but I would say, you know, and I brought up a few obscure shows. and But then, of course, the, the Sopranos and The Wire and Homeland and stuff like that. And it's turned into something that I think appeals to more people than just, you know, actors or directors, because it's kind of getting putting you inside the experience of directing and you get a kind of inside view of, we see, it's like the point that, Stephen, the question you started with, you know, do you get intimidated by actors? It's like, it's like, showing the humanity of what the whole process is that it's like, you know, you guys are trying to find it just like I'm trying to find it. And no. we're trying to find it together. It's, it doesn't just spring fully formed from somebody's head. It's like a collaborative effort. And right. I think it's, uh, I hope it, I hope it's entertaining for that. Reason. And uh, it's called the directing great television inside TV's new golden age. And when does it come out? Is it out now? It's uh, it may be out by the time this uh, airs, it's coming out September 7th. I want to ask you what, you know, Sopranos, they always talk about was one of the shows that ushered in maybe the show, the, this new golden age. Yeah. What, what's the before and at what, what is, what, how do you define the golden age? What are the qualities of TV that, that yeah, that's a, 
that's a great question. I and I actually try to address that in the first chapter a little bit, but it's like you know, to me, it's just a far more nuanced, uh, complex, serialized view over you know long. So it's like a it's a world that gets entered, and and the characters are not so simple, and morality is not so clear cut. It's more like life. It seems like to me, it's what I'm drawn to in a project. You know, I want to see, I want to explore what. It, what it's like to be on this earth, you know, right. and dealing with real situations instead of all the bullshit that used to happen or the, or the, you know, getting to watch the character do their bit one more time. You know, it's right. like, it's like, it's, it's, it's art, you know, and, uh, and the Sopranos, there's a lot of reasons for it, but, you know, I think the, the sweet spot that happened when uh, the Sopranos came along was HBO, you know, was not a network. It didn't have to get, you know, it had subscribers. It didn't have to appeal to the lowest common denominator to get the number most people. It could appeal to a niche of intelligent people who were interested in something. And uh, so they, and they didn't have the five act, you know, five commercial break things and all that stuff. So it could explore and, and try things. And I think that's pretty much uh, set the template. Then I guess the next one that kind of feels like in that category is probably six feet under and the wire came short. HBO kind of dominated for the first several years. And now I, I don't think we're out of it. I don't think we're likely ever to get out of it. No. I think there's so many different, uh, you know, it, it, it's really kind of a glut is one of the unfortunate. It's great in the sense that there's so many shows and there's more opportunities for people like us. But I miss a little bit. Well, so one of the great things about The Sopranos is you guys experienced firsthand was it was the water cooler show. It was like, oh my God, did you watch last night? And now it's like, it's hard. It's hard for any show. You get a Game of Thrones occasionally and all that, but it's hard for any show to really make that much of a mark and people don't have to watch it the night it airs. So that was another great thing about that time. Besides, What was, what was your favorite show growing up? What did you watch? <laughs> well, I grew up, I, I, you know, uh, I, I was watching shows like Bonanza when I was a kid, but, uh, uh, Good you know, show. When I, was a, when I was a younger guy, I liked Kojak. You know, I liked uh, great show. What? Else? what? Oh, yeah, that's good. Great I like Ario. I liked you know, but those aren't uh, those aren't nearly the quality we have now. You know. But what? What besides the stuff you're working on right yeah. now? What's a show you would recommend? I, you know, it's like my wife and I. We sit in the pandemic and we're checking out Netflix. I, these are obscure shows. I like. I love this French show called The Bureau. It's like uh, it's like the CIA. It's kind of like a homeland. France, I think that's great. Right now, I'm watching this show from from Sweden called The Restaurant. I think that's a great show. It's just like people tell me shows they love, and I've never heard of them. Probably like the two shows I just mentioned, but those are what kind of come to mind. Cool. Yeah, and you're here, work, you're here working on Billions. Great show. Yeah, I've watched every episode since the beginning. Great. great oh, good. Show. So you watch your up. Well somewhere. acted. The stories are great. Absolutely. I don't know if there's time, if there isn't, you can cut it out, but I did want to share one story from The Sopranos because I, I featured it in the book and I think it's a really nice story. I, I wrote a chapter on staging. I did a, a chapter on getting the performance and then staging the scene. And one of my greatest experiences staging was on The Sopranos and it was owing to Gandolfini. And it was um, uh, in the end, at the end of the show, Mergers and Acquisitions. In that particular episode, just to refresh you and listeners maybe uh, Tony's had this reconciliation with Carmela they're trying to kind of make their marriage work and he's given her a beautiful uh, ring at the start or no I guess that's in Luzel anyway they're trying to make amends with each other but he can't resist sleeping with Valentina you know and uh, Carmela discovers a, a nail nail in bed and that's why she's furious at, at Tony and uh the last scene is she's taken forty thousand dollars out of the bird feeder out in the bush. Right. Tony, Tony has has gone out there. He realizes, okay, what the fuck's happening here? He comes back. He's dressing, and he's just putting. And she had placed the nail, the nail right with his change and his keys because she knew he'd find it. So now he knows that she knows, and uh, he comes downstairs, and Carmela is sitting at the table. And this is like, you know, the final confrontation. And I had a staging in mind. I don't even remember what the staging was. But we rehearsed the scene. And Tony, or Jim, he like stays as far away. You know the set in the whole big, huge room. He stays as far away from Carmela as he possibly can. She's sitting at the, 
at the dinner table with drinking her coffee. And he's, he just cir- circles behind her, goes all the way into the kitchen, and says, uh, and Carmela's, you know, sitting in the catbird seat, just waiting for him to bring it up so she can just kill it. And uh, she says, you want any coffee? Tell him, you know. And he goes, mm, uh, no. You got any decaf? She says, yeah, you want decaf? I can make decaf. And she walks towards him in the kitchen. But he, as soon as she approaches him, he walks all the way over to the other end of the whole dining room, living room. It's like you're watching this stage. You're like, what's going on? You know? And then AJ comes in and, and they're having this conversation, which is all subtext. She says, uh, you know, have you been out by the pool? You know, the pool guy out there, what's going on? So he's communicating to her. I know what you've done, but I'm not going to accuse you because if he accuses her, He's going to take the full brunt. He's going to be killed. AJ realizes it's too weird. He gets the fuck out. And, and then Carmela comes and sits down. And she says, you sure, Tom? There's nothing you want to talk about? He says, no. What could, what could be wrong? Something wrong with you? And it's like you just leave these two characters. They're both standing still. It's like Tony realizes, I got to survive. For the, for, you know, I can't win this battle. So I got to survive. I got to let her know. I know. But I'm not going to accuse her of anything so she can't kill me. And it's just mm. the sweetest little thing. And it all came from Jim just saying, I would not get anywhere near her. And this beautiful case of where LA actors kind of informed the scene. I just loved it so much. Instinct, yeah. yeah. You know, actor's instinct. Yeah. And he was a, you know, both of those, you don't get better than those two. No, not at all. <laughs> you just don't. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the top of our craft, those two, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. those two people. All right, Dave. All right, Thanks brother. You very much. Thanks Thank again. You so much. You All the best. Take care of yourself. You Appreciate too. It. Good Thank luck on the book. Much. Thanks a lot, man. See you later. Bye-bye. See you, pal. Director Dan Adius. Uh, Good guy. Good. Great director. Good luck with his book, which is, hold on, hold on. It's called Directing Great Television Inside, Inside. TV's New Golden Age. Wherever you get your books, uh, let's take a break and uh, let's get into the episode. Okay, now it's time for the Talking Spreaders Ask Me Anything segment. The winner of our AMA Best Question is Lorenzo from Puglia, Italy. And we're sending Lorenzo's a pair of Bose headphones. Lorenzo asks, uh, Sopranos is a pioneer show in the industry of the TV series as we know them today. Uh, and after 20 years, is still one of the best shows ever. In your opinion, why in Italy did the show not have the same successes in the rest of the world? Have you ever heard some feedback about it? Big hugs from the old country, Lorenzo. You've talked about this. Before. Well, we've talked about this, you know, uh, a big issue. Um, you know, Italy, in the beginning, they didn't even really watch it. There was kind of no interest. And I don't even know if it was showing. It was on some... And then it was on like really late night cable that a lot of people didn't have. It's really, uh, there's a lot of fans in Italy now, like Lorenzo and Puglia. And uh, I hear from fans in Italy all the time. I was just in Italy uh, this fall and met a lot of our fans over there. Um, And I think really it was they did not get the concept or not believe the concept of a mob boss going to therapy. To them, it was like, why is he going to therapy? He's a mob boss. He doesn't want to change. This is what he does. Um, I guess to them, people who go to therapy are people who are more uh, responsible, you know, human beings who want to do good in the world and want to be, you know, good people. And they just felt like the, a criminal does not need that. And, um, you know, the Blue Comet episode really confirms that in a way, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, a person, uh, I, I have a friend of mine that's a, a therapist in Brooklyn. She's been at it for a long time. She told me in, in Bensonhurst, and she told me uh, she's talked to many wise guys over the years. In many, therapy. In therapy. Many. Wow. She said, oh, and she said, oh, what I could tell you, which, of course, she never told me. She never mentioned oh, names like uh, no. Kupferberg did. No. No. No, 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 no. Not at all. She just said, it's not far from the truth. Believe me, I could tell you things. And she never did. I never wanted to know. And she's not like that anyway. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was your therapist? No. Not my 
my therapist. It's, listen, it's okay. You can, I know it's you okay. You can say you went to therapy. I told you I went to better help. All right. There you go. But this I woman was your therapist. To, no, That's a, okay. She's a fucking friend of mine, I said. Why don't you listen? No, I listen. She's a friend. She's a friend of mine. Someone I know. I didn't go to her. And that's why BetterHelp would be great for wise guys and people that uh, uh, don't want people to know their business. That's true. They don't. She want was right in the heart of the neighborhood. People could have easily went into to see her, could see them coming out of the office. That's why BetterHelp is so, just incredible. So she said she could tell you things like what? Wise guys and many of them, not one or two, that went to therapy. Must have told us stuff. Wow. Interesting. She's still there. Been there for many, many years. All right. Well, there you go. All the way from, uh, we're going to send a pair of Bose headphones all the way to Puglia, Italy. Thanks, Lorenzo. Thanks for listening. Now, Michael, uh, we always do the credits. I always read the first part. I want to read the second. Thanks for listening. And remember, new episodes are released every Monday. Please subscribe. But do it as me. Do it as me. Start from the top. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Remember, new episodes are released every Monday. Please subscribe. You know what? I don't care if you subscribe. You know, whatever. do whatever the hell you want to do. Follow us on Twitter if you want or Instagram. I don't really care anymore. I'm almost done. There's merchandise, but we're almost done here anyway. You're not going to be able to buy the merchandise. So you better watch, listen, do whatever the fuck you want. Our executive producer is Jeff Sussman. Producer is Andy Verderam. Our music was composed... Uh, and performed by the great Elijah Amitin. You can hear more of Elijah's music and the band Zopa, which Elijah and Michael play in together by clicking the links on TalkingSopranos.com. Our production crew includes Ty Verderam and Sierra Sharipa. Talking Sopranos is a Pod Jams production. Michael, I'll see you next week. See you later. Bye.